Hello, everybody. This is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Welcome to this Fellowship Friday. Well, you asked for it, so I'm going to do it. Uh, I hope that uh, uh, these Friday night programs uh, are a blessing to all of you. It hopefully will give us an opportunity to uh, not only have fellowship, but um, give our praise reports. Uh, we, we all have a lot to be thankful for, and I think we need to tell everybody how great our, our great Savior God Jesus is, how, how he does say yes to us. And he, uh, he said to t give all of our troubles and burdens over to him, and we do it. And it's time to praise him and thank him for it. Now, last Friday, we focused on miracles. And it was fascinating. It was wonderful to be able to praise God for the miraculous things that he's done in our lives. Uh, last Friday was the first time in, I'd say, about at least five or six years of doing these live streams. I think I've hosted approximately 600 of them now. But last Friday was the first time I publicly posted the link to join the panel. I normally, in, a, in our Sunday program, on our Wednesday Bible study, and anytime I do a special panel discussion on uh, a subject, I send the link uh, to a, a few selected saints. I don't send it for, for the world. I don't publish it openly because I don't want to have people joining it who uh, I haven't selected for the, a purpose. Uh, these programs, though, uh, I posted the link here in the chat room. All I ask is if you want to click on the link and join the panel, that uh, you, you uh, read over the statement of faith. It's it's in every one of my uh, uh, videos on in the description box. Um, that's another one of my pet peeves, grievances uh, against almost all uh, who. Uh, we know even the even the, the, the saints that uh, we fellowship and love so much I I see a failure to to publish a statement of faith uh, but my statement of faith is on every video in the description box so if you do want to click on that link and join me uh, tonight I uh, I ask that you read the statement of faith first and if you are in complete agreement with it, then uh, you can join this and we can have some fellowship. Um, I don't think fellowship can take place unless we share this common faith. If someone does not believe that Jesus is eternal God Almighty, but they believe that he's simply a great man, a great prophet, but not God himself, then... Uh, he doesn't agree with one of the core doctrines of Christianity, that Christ is God Almighty. How can we have fellowship with someone who denies the deity of Christ? If someone does not believe that salvation is received as a free gift without any religious works on our part required of us, Salvation is offered as a free gift by grace alone, only because God is gracious, not because we have any personal merit. And it's, it's through faith alone. It means only because we believe, not because we've contributed to our salvation in any way. Any contribution we try to make towards it, the Bible says it's filthy rags. And this faith Faith alone must be only on Jesus. The faith must be completely on Jesus. You can have no faith in yourself. If you divide your faith between Jesus and your own ability to be righteous, to be good, uh, then uh, the Bible says you've nullified the grace of God. You've canceled it out. Uh, you've, you've made uh, Christ of none effect. There is no value in faith that's divided between your works and Jesus' finished work on the cross. 
so the second core doctrine is that we must put our faith only in what Jesus has done for us, his, what he accomplished for, for us on the cross by paying for all of our sins, and that uh, and we must also believe in the promise of Jesus. And Jesus promised eternal life to all who believe in him for it. Uh, eternal means that it lasts forever. So if you get eternal life because of faith alone in Christ alone, you don't have to worry about losing it. Otherwise, it wasn't eternal life, was it? It was temporary life, or it was probationary life. You have life as long as you behave, and then if you misbehave, you believe it. You, you, you lose it. Well, that's not the gospel. The gospel is we're, we're, we're saved by believing, not by behaving. So the core doctrines I ask you to agree with are uh, the deity of Christ, faith alone in Christ alone for salvation, and eternal security. Uh, if you agree with those points, then you're welcome to click on a link and join me. Uh, after last Friday's program, a lot of people said that uh, the program was a, a great blessing and they wanted to continue them, so I'm here. I, I might be the only one here, it looks like. <laughs> but I'll be here for a little while at least. If no one joins me, then uh, I, I'll consider it a failed experiment. Uh, I talked about in a video I made the other day about um, uh, this uh, announcing these, this new program, Fellowship Fridays. And uh, I had some reservations about doing this because if I say that uh, I'm going to have a program on Friday nights, it's, uh, it's, it's a promise that I've made. <laughs> and just as Jesus is faithful to keep his promise, uh, you know, I, I have to keep my promise. So uh, I'm here tonight. But I also feel that uh, making a commitment to, to have a live program every Sunday, also another live program every Wednesday, is, a, is an obligation and a duty that I've accepted and uh, it's, it's works that I've uh, accepted the responsibility to do. Uh, so how much work can I make a commitment to? <clears throat> I was leery about making a commitment to a third day on Friday nights uh, because it seems that so many who participated last Friday uh, wanted almost even demanded that we continue these friday night programs <clears throat> i've agreed <clears throat> to do it <clears throat> but if this program becomes um, like my attitude is that it's, it's not a joy to do it it's not a uh, it, it's not a labor of love but it's uh, becomes a drudgery or a burden then uh, then of course i wouldn't do it i, I will not do it out of uh, any kind of religious obligation I have. So, okay, let me see who we have in the chat room here. Uh, starting from top to bottom, we got Third Samuel. Hello, hello, grace and peace back to you, Third Samuel. And we got Celine as usual, liberally conservative. Shalom, he says. Well, shalom means peace. I don't speak Hebrew, but I'm <laughs> I'm happy to learn some if you can teach me. Shalom. Thank you. Thank you for the blessing, liber liberally conservative. Liberally conservative seems like an oxymoron, those two ideas butt heads. But I think uh, you could say that uh, you have um, a generous amount of conservative. Uh, and then uh, Z Will, hi Z. Here. Hi there. Uh, your statement of faith is flawed. The pastor at my church told me that sometimes we want to make scripture say something that sounds good to us and makes us comfortable. Okay. Z will. Uh, everybody's per, uh, free to participate on the panel if you agree with the statement of faith. If you disagree with the statement of faith, you can be in the pet in, in the chat room. However, I will not allow people in the chat room to argue against the core doctrines of Christianity. And that's what the statement of 
of faith expresses and, and explains these core doctrines. The deity of Christ, faith alone in Christ alone for salvation and eternal security. If there's something wrong with any of those three in your opinion, then uh, listen and learn. But uh, you can't come into any congregation and start arguing against their core doctrines in their church. So I'm going to keep an eye on you, as he will. Sometimes the truth is hard to swallow. My church leaders are helping me see scriptural truth. Okay. You haven't said what you think is wrong. And after we are saved, we need to put in good works. Okay, Z well. Uh, Z well, let's go to his channel here. And let's hide him. It's nice knowing you, Z well. I don't allow people to come into the church and argue against the core doctrines of our church. So let me see, we've got, uh, uh, Maureen believes, hello Maureen, Frank B. Okay, by the way, I published the, uh, the link. Let me do it again. You can scroll back and find it, but I'll publish it again right now. Uh, if you want to click on the link and join me as, as the panel, feel free to click on that link right there. Uh, so case over. Well, Brother Mark, would be wrong if I call myself a Christian, but I trust in Christ alone. Would it be wrong if I call myself a Christian, but I trust in Christ alone? No, that's what a Christian is. If you do not trust in Christ alone, then you would not be a Christian. If you're saying that you do trust in Christ alone, then you're entitled to claim the name of Christ, Christian, one who's relying completely on Christ. That's what we hope for everybody to understand and believe. <clears throat> I'm not for or against Calvinism, but I'm researching and learning and appreciate you. Brother Luke and Renee Roll. <clears throat> okay, uh, if you're not familiar with the problems of Calvinism, liberally conservative, I have a playlist titled Calvinism Debunked. Uh, on that playlist, I have um, personally and along with a group panel uh, spent probably eight or ten hours refuting all of the points of Calvinism. Uh, and then I've also collected uh, videos from many other uh, Bible teachers who are also refuting uh, every tenet of Calvinism. But liberally conservative, I'll tell you, uh, they have a, an acronym that they use uh, to identify Calvinism. It's called TULIP, T-U-L-I-P. And the, C, the P stands for total depravity but they really interpret it as total inability and that man has absolutely no ability uh, to ever uh, believe. Uh, God has to choose someone and make him believe or, or choose to not let someone believe. But man is not free to believe or not believe. Um, that's total inability. They all, the next point of Calvinism is, is the U and Tulip, <clears throat> unconditional election. In other words, people are chosen, they say they're chosen or elected for salvation uh, based on no condition at all. But the Bible says there is a condition for salvation. And the condition is that we believe on Jesus for it. And uh, it's up to us to believe in Jesus for it. It's not, uh, God does not um, force someone or prohibit, prohibit others from believing in Jesus. Um, and then the, the L in TULIP is limited atonement. Now the Bible says that Jesus died for the sins of every person in the world. It says he's the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It's clear in the Bible that Jesus paid for the sins of every person, uh, believers and non-believers. Uh, and uh, the, uh, uh, the Calvinist viewpoint is limited atonement that uh, his shed blood and death on the cross only serves as a payment for uh, the elect, the little percentage of people who 
God chooses to believe. Now, it is true that the percentage of humanity that do believe is small. I estimate it to be about 3% of humanity. But it's not true that um, um, we have do not have the ability uh, to be a believer. Um, that, that God, it's totally up to God to make us believe. And unless he makes us believe, he's not allowing us to believe. So that's where the problem lies uh, in uh, limited atonement. Uh, he died for everybody. Anybody can, can benefit from it by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. <clears throat> and then um, the I in TULIP is irresistible grace. And that is the doctrine that uh, when God makes you believe, that uh, he says you're going to believe, then, then you can't resist it. You have to become a believer against your will. And uh, it's clear in the Bible that uh, an easy example I could give you is Jesus said, well, so I wish that I could gather you under my arms like a hen and, and bring you in, in, I'm paraphrasing it, bring you into the kingdom, but you would not. There's many verses in the Bible where it, where it clearly says that we, will not believe we're choosing not to believe we will not and god uh, allows us to not believe uh, so irresistible grace is a is also a false uh, doctrine and then the final point is perseverance of the saints it is true that uh, preservation of the saints is the eternal security i mean god preserves us we're sealed with the holy spirit that's the preservation. There's nothing that can uh, ever cause us to lose our salvation. Uh, but persevering for our salvation is, is a false doctrine. They, they apply it in two ways. One, that a, a believer will persevere in good works. In other words, if you're really a believer, that you will change your life, get sin out of your life, and do good works as proof. And if you don't have the changed life as proof, then they say you're not you never really got saved uh, so you must persevere your whole life in good works and never fall back into any sin and that's impossible no one can do that perfectly and you'd have to do it perfectly for it to be effective the bible says that uh, if you want to be under this law legal system where of, of works then you're putting yourself under a curse because it's impossible to do it perfectly and perfection is what's required in james it says if you keep all the law but offend in one point you're guilty of all so as it's impossible to uh, uh, think that we could be saved by our works to get saved to think that our, our works a change life is necessary to keep our salvation it would be possible to keep it then uh, because none of us are able to live a perfectly sinless life after we get saved and you certainly don't have to prove your salvation by your changed life to me. And if anybody else wants that as proof, then they don't understand the gospel. Uh, there, the second part of the perseverance is something that uh, some among us disagree, and that is persevering with your faith. Uh, I believe that a person can truly believe, and then they can have their faith shipwrecked, in the, even though they really believed. They have eternal security, so they're saved, but they're they're doubting now. They're they're fearing for their salvation, or they or, or they no longer have faith. Um, so a, a person's faith does not have to persevere. Um, and then some say that if you your faith does not persevere, it proves you didn't ever really have a saving faith. So those are uh, the doctrines of Calvinism. But there's one more. Uh, I'm directing this to. Uh, uh, who was it that asked that question? Caleb, I think, I don't remember. Whoever asked me about Calvinism, I'm sorry. But um, uh, yeah, liberally conservative. Uh, the, those are the five points of Calvinism, but there's really six points to Calvinism. And most people don't uh, um, don't really understand and, and preach against all six points. But the sixth point really should be the first point. It should be the foundation that Tulip rests upon this foundation. And it's the foundation of of um, the sovereignty of God is absolute. Now, did you know that uh, the word sovereign and sovereignty is not in the Bible? 
at least it's not my KJV Bible. Now the concept of the sovereignty of God, we, we can find in the Bible, just like the, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the concept I think is, is safe to, to conclude that God is a triune Godhead. But uh, with sovereignty, uh, yeah, I can see that God is sovereign in the Bible, but the word sovereign is not there. But the Calvinists take the word sovereignty and the, uh, the idea that God is sovereign to what I would call hyper sovereignty. We got, uh, you know, uh, hyper dispensationalism, uh, hyper everything. Uh, people, they, they ever, it seems like people want to take it up as a doctrine and then either extend it too far in one direction or too far in the other direction. Like take baptism. Paul only says, you better not get baptized. You've got to stay dry. If you get wet, you're not saved because your faith wasn't in Jesus. Your faith was in the water. The, uh, the Pentecostal, they believe in baptismal regeneration. And they say, unless you get wet, you're not saved. You can believe, but until you get submerged in water, you're not saved. These are two extreme viewpoints that are both wrong and not biblical. The truth is, if you never get wet, but you believe on Jesus for your salvation, you're saved. But you should get wet. You should uh, take advantage of the opportunity of a public uh, baptism. Because the, the baptism is the best opportunity for a new believer to profess their faith to their friends and family. Um, because water baptism it illustrates our, our the gospel. We are submerged in water, representing our death, and we're come out of the water as our resurrection in Christ. Death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and the, the death of the, our, ourselves, and the new birth of the child of God. And so, if you invite your friends and family to your water baptism, that's a good opportunity for you to witness to them and explain this new faith that you have. But if you choose to never do that, it doesn't it doesn't affect if you're saved or not, and there's not degrees of salvation, you're not more saved if you get wet. Wet. Okay, uh, let me see. Uh, but, uh, okay, getting back to the sovereignty of Calvinism. Um, God is sovereign in this respect. Um, it, it's fair to refer to a, a, an ancient king as the sovereign of the country. It just means he's king, that he has the ultimate authority. He can do whatever he wants that's within uh, his ability. He can. He has the ability to do it. He doesn't have to answer to anybody. He can decide to do whatever he wants. And, and so God is also our sovereign king. He can do whatever he wants. But sovereign does not mean that the king actually exercises absolute control of everybody in the kingdom. That's absolutely impossible in, in the world. But spiritually, uh, Calvinist wants us to believe that God is exercising absolute control over us at all times. That God controls every word that comes out of my mouth, even every thought in my mind. God made me think it. And God controls me like a puppet, making me move about and do things, or not do things. That, uh, that I'm just basically a, a puppet, absolutely controlled by God in, in word, thought, and deed. That's the sovereignty of Calvinism. And it's absurd, and it's not biblical, and it's evil. Because if that was the truth, it would make God actually the only one that's evil. I would be an innocent puppet. I could go before God at the judgment and say, I didn't sin. It wasn't me that chose to sin or did it. You controlled me. You made me sin. You're the one that forced me to sin. Think of the, the worst examples of evil. And then in this world, we would say that God controlled him and made him do it. So the, 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 the real, uh, the, the, the villain that was doing these horrible sins is off the hook. And, and God actually becomes the only guilty party because he's making people sin. Uh, so that's the error of uh, hyper-sovereignty of Calvinism. And that's why I despise it. It attacks the very character and nature of our great Savior God. 
Okay. Well, that was my response to uh, uh, to uh, hmm, liberally conservative about Calvinism. I hope you understand now why I have on my statement of faith I'm not a Calvinism, and if someone is a Calvinism wanting to uh, teach that, then I have to object to it because I don't want them. Uh, teaching this is a different God that they believe in. Their God is evil. Melton Zone, hi. Hello, how are you doing? How am I doing? <clears throat> well, I'm not going to give Brother Mark's answer. Uh, uh, I'm going to say that uh, I'm blessed so much, it's embarrassing. I, if I told you of all my blessings, and that's really what these Friday night programs hopefully will be, if I start telling you about all my blessings, I actually worry that I might be hurting someone else who's not so blessed, that has problems. I, I, I feel bad about, I'm boasting in God that he's doing so good to me. And yet I know that others have issues and I don't, uh, I, I don't want to kind of rub salt in their wound that I'm so full of joy and peace and happiness. I want them to have it too. So that's how I am. It would be better, though, if I was dead, brother. To be present with the Lord. Yeah, absent from the body. I'd be present with the Lord. To live as Christ, but to die is gain. So to, yeah, it would be better if I was dead. But I'm not dead. I'm alive, and I'm filled with the joy and peace uh, the Holy Spirit gave me. How are you doing? Doing great. Uh, praise God. <laughs> yeah. You know, he... Uh... Um, I'm getting over a little more and more of my anxiety again. So just we're getting over what <laughs> my anxiety that I've had that I've been struggling with. Uh, I guess I've, I uh, haven't paid enough attention. I didn't know you had, you're suffering from anxiety. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. If you, you're, if you're getting over it, see, I mean, we, we, I'm going to ask everybody to pray for you so, to God to help you with get rid of this anxiety. Please do that, everybody, congregation. Pray for Brother Esteban to God to, to heal him of anxiety. But uh, uh, you've said that you're doing better with it. So let's, let's turn this around and let's get some praise report about how much better you're doing. Uh, I would have to say that um, I'm not so focused on it as much anymore. I'm more focused on Christ. Uh, and what he did in his finished works and just fo reading the scripture daily. And it's been helping me out. It, he's been helping me. He's been the one that's doing all this. I'm not doing anything. <laughs> yeah. So praise him for that because like, Amen. I couldn't do it without him. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Um, if we are focused on Jesus, we're not going to be focused on ourselves and the problems that we have. Um, I say this so much, it's, it's, uh, I feel like I'm turned it into a, a cliche. I say, I've got a video on that. <laughs> well, I, I've got over 60 playlists and over a thousand videos. So uh, pretty much anything it seemed like I could say, I've got a video on that. And the, um, the idea of focus, staying focused on Jesus, that solves really all, all, all our problems. If we stop thinking of ourselves and realize that uh, salvation is not a sin issue, so don't worry about your sin. Just stay focused on Jesus. How 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 am I going to go about carrying out sins if I've got Jesus on my mind all the time? And uh, but I will tell you this, brother. As far as um, what was the word? How was you expressed it? I call I call it worry. But what? We, how do you say it? Uh, for anxiety. Anxiety. Anxiety is worry, right? Uh think so um it's it's like a it's a nerve-wracking feeling that you always feel anxious everywhere you go um i mean like uh, like I'd, I'd go into say like the mall or something and i start to feel anxious i just can't sit still and um the thing that really got me through it was Christ. I mean, I would focus on him and I would remember John three sixteen. 16 uh, verses just started popping in my head. And it's like, 
the more you focus on him, the less you worry about what's what's going on in you know in your uh, in your situations. So, um, I mean, he uh, he's getting me through it. That's all I can say. He's the one that's carrying me. I'm, I'm not doing anything. Hmm. Yeah. Well, um, I you know a lot of times people have a problem, and I really feel bad because I cannot relate to it because I haven't had that particular problem. Um, but in this case, I relate completely because the, the burden that I've had for as long as I can remember is also worry. Anxiety. Anxiety is worrying about things. And uh, I say, hey, I have peace and joy and happiness. Yeah, I do. But I'll tell you how I worry. I worry about my wife and my son all the time. I worry about other people that I uh, am close to, and and and, and uh, I'm just I worry that somehow something's going to happen to them. That they're going to get in a car accident, they're going to get sick or something. I worry about that, and and worry. You know, worry is opposite of faith. Worry means you don't have faith. Now I have I have faith in Jesus for my salvation, but do I have faith that Jesus is going to? Uh, provide uh, protection and, and as all, all the needs for my wife and son all the time. I pray for it every single day. Lord, please uh, bless my wife and son. I'm a, I pray for others too, but please, Lord, bless my wife and my son. Keep them safe. Bless them. Give them health and everything, everything good. And uh, I'm always got that worry though. And so, I, it's, it's embarrassing to me, you have to admit it, because I think that worry is, is opposite of faith. It's lack of faith. And, and Jesus said, he actually said, do not worry. <laughs> Remember? Do not worry. It, it, the flowers, look, they're clothed, they're with beauty. I mean, he talks about the birds, and he takes care of the birds and the flowers. And, and he really, uh, he goes to pretty great lengths. To, to tell us not to worry. And yet I still do. That's very true. Also, um, I wanted to say also in uh, Joshua 1.9, Have I not commanded you, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be you wor- uh, dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we could... Uh, uh, the nice thing is that the, the technology we have today is wonderful where we can very easily find verses on a particular subject. Uh, but uh, uh, I have a little pocket Bibles too. I have a lot of different kinds of Bibles, but this pocket Bible, it's a Gideon Bible, and it has a little reference page on it where you can it, look up any subject like worry or sickness or anything. And, and then it'll list verses that should comfort you and help you with that that issue. And it'll list the verse where they are so you can find them easily. But now it's even easier with the technology. You just ask Google, Google, Bible verses about worry. And boom, in a second, I've got all these verses, you know. I can just ask my phone or all these apps that we have. Um, so there's plenty of verses in the Bible that should be giving us comfort. Um but I'm glad that it's, uh, things are getting better for you. And uh, just anxiety is easing. Let's see. Uh, Luke, next one. Alex is there. Uh, Brother Luke, I worried and prayed to God that my dad got saved. Been worried for a long time when I prayed again, and God put in dreams saying, I am love, trust. I will say my dad died two weeks later. You didn't say if he got saved. I don't know. I'm, it sounds like you, you left that out. Maybe he didn't get saved. But, you know, God doesn't impose salvation on anybody. You could you could pray for God. I, I want my father to be saved. I can't make it your dad believe. You can't make your dad believe. God will not make him believe. 
Uh, so um, we just have to do everything we can. But here's one of the sad things, Esteban. I know that you're you're in. Uh, are you still in school uh, in um, seminary? Uh, right now, uh, actually, I'm I'm not. Um, my uh, my cousin uh, passed away uh, a few weeks ago, or uh, about a, about a month or two ago now. Um, I can't really remember for sure, but like my. I was I couldn't focus on school when that happened. Um, I grew up with him. He was only a year behind me. He has a muscular. He had muscular dystrophy, so they said that he wasn't even gonna survive. He was gonna pass away when he was eighteen, and um, so I, I had to deal with that. Uh, I had a hard time even going to his funeral. Uh, I didn't know how to deal with it. Um, all I can think of was Christ, and I said, "I'm gonna see him." I'm going to see him one day. I'm going to see him again. He's going to be able to run to me. We're going to be able to run and talk and everything. And um, Well, so. uh, I was going to say, uh, as you pursue this, whether you do it formally or can more casually as we are doing here, I got ordained by an organization of street preachers many years ago. But I've never gone to any formal seminary Everything I've learned is from my own study and, and reading and talking and arguing among other with other believers about all these things. And uh, hopefully the Holy Spirit has influenced me and given me the right answers. I know I wasn't right about a lot of things because there's a few things that I was proven wrong and I had to change my position. But uh, that's how I went about, about learning rather than a formal training uh, through a seminary. But... Uh, whether you pursue that and become a pastor or whether you do this kind of ministry work, uh, obviously everybody called into evangelism. Um, the, the hardest thing for most of us to accept is that other people's salvation is completely out of our hands. It's, uh, it is very uh, frustrating and it's it can be uh, heartbreaking when we want certain people, our closest loved ones. We want them so much to believe, but we can't make them believe. And sometimes we try too hard, and it does more harm than good. But we can't make them believe. So I believe that uh, we need to adopt an attitude as evangelists, like an emergency room. Uh, doctor, or let's say a, uh, a cancer doctor. Uh, cancer has a better cure rate now than it used to. It used to be almost a complete death sentence. But let's say you're you're treating for an illness that has a very high mortality rate, or you're working in an emergency room and people come in there every day and they're too sick or injured to, and you can't save them. Well, these doctors are actually taught that you need to develop a callus and not let yourself get emotionally involved because when you lose someone, uh, they call it detachment is the word I'm thinking of. You need to be detached because when you lose someone and you're not, if you're not detached, if you're too invested emotionally in them, uh, it hurts you too much. And when it happens over and over, it can be devastating to you psychologically and you may break down. So we need to just accept that, look, I'm going to plant and I'm going to water. I'm going to be ready with an answer. Then it's out of my hands. Even for the people I love the most, it's out of my hands. I'll always be there to keep on explaining and, tell, and teaching them. But I can't make them believe. And uh, so it's between them and the Lord. And uh, it does help me, though, that I do not believe in eternal torment. When I believed in eternal torment of the lost, I, uh, it was even harder to accept it. Uh, that you love someone and they're not saved. And I thought they're not saved from eternal torment. That's what would happen to them. So that's really hard to cope with. But now they're not, I believe they're not saved from the second death, which is just a perish. Uh, and that makes it much easier for me uh, to uh, uh, deal with it, but it also 
I'm not doing it because it's easier to deal with it. I, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that because that's my conclusion now from the Bible that people will not be eternally tormented. They will, they will uh, just be destroyed, both body and soul, in the lake of fire. You know, um, I'm have I was having a hard time too with with my uh, grandfather. Um, he he believes in purgatory still, so I, I tried to explain it to him through um, the rich man and Lazarus, and said there's no purgatory. Um, and I was trying to do it really gently. I didn't want to get him upset right away or anything. I just I tried to just talk to him. Um, he literally started, you know, getting upset with me. And I was like, Hey, but you asked me about it. I, I just, I just wanted to give you the answer. Cause you asked me, is there such thing as purgatory? Cause you read the Bible a lot. She, he was just asking me. And I said, no, from the biblical standpoint, there is no, there's no such thing as purgatory. And I was giving him that, you know, the rich men and Lazarus and he, uh, he got upset with me and, uh, it wasn't a good conversation after that. I, I tried to just, I just kept quiet and let him say what he had to say. I, I didn't want to, like, I didn't want him to get angry with me. I wanted him to just know that, you know, the Bible just says, you know, there's either hell or heaven. Yeah. You know, you're going to. So, you remember how I, uh, I said a few minutes ago that uh, it's, a cliche, I guess, but I can say about any, anything we're talking about is that I have a video on that. I have a playlist on that. So I'm seeing here liberally conservative. Wait, what? No eternal torment? With 20 question marks. Liberally conservative is probably shocked, maybe appalled that I would say I don't believe in eternal torment for the lost. But I'm not going to try to persuade anybody. That's why I make my playlist. Um, I will say this to uh, to um, liberally conservative anybody else who questions this position I have that uh, for 25 years I believe in the doctrine of eternal torment of the lost. I taught it openly. I defended it vigorously, and. Um, and then I had my mind changed by a brother that and it did the other viewpoint. We argued it out free here. And I have a saying, uh, there's a saying here. Let me find it. Uh, uh, this is one of the things I think is so important for a person to, uh, to uh, get. This is not in the Bible, but it says, um, remember why we debate. Now, I was debating eternal torment with my old friend, Brother Tony. None of you here know Tony. but uh, So we're debating it for a year. He's attending my home church for seven years. I led him to the Lord, and he's attending my home church. And uh, he, he learns that there's no eternal torment, and he wants to tell me and everybody else in the congregation about it. And most were appalled by it and didn't want to hear him. But I heard him, and I listened, and we talked about it for a year. So he says, remember why we debate. We have nothing to lose but the errors we hold. Who but a stubborn fool would hold on to errors once they've been exposed? Uh, writer was unknown. Who but a stubborn fool would hold on to their errors once they've been exposed? Well, uh, I agreed to debate it out with Tony privately for a year, and when I was proven wrong, I will not be a stubborn fool and insist that I'm right. If I'm clearly wrong now, I'm going to adjust my position. And, and that's what I would suggest to uh, uh, liberally conservative and anybody else. Uh, the, there, uh, there are probably three or four uh, doctrinal positions uh, that I've held for, as I say, about 25 years and then was corrected. See, see you, if you can correct me, anybody here wants to correct me in something, at least you should know that unless it's something I've already studied both sides. See, almost every question has two sides, maybe even three possible answers. But if you have two or three possible answers, 
but you've only studied one of the answers, you're not really very educated, are you? You're ignorant of the other possibilities. So uh, I suggest that everybody open their mind and listen to opposing points of view on all these things. And because I listened, I uh, there's a few things where the other person won this argument. And, and I had to admit, you've proven me wrong. There's another quote here that I like. It says, uh, when an honestly mistaken man learns the truth, he will either no longer be mistaken or he will cease to be honest. Uh, so whatever you want to say about me, and I know some of you love me and some hate me, but whatever you want to say about me, I think you have to admit that I, I am honest about my beliefs and my conclusions. I, I came to a conclusion many years ago that truth supersedes popularity. If I come to a biblical position on a subject that's a minority viewpoint, I'm not going to keep it secret. It would be dishonest. Uh, see, sometimes you can just say a lie and it's clear that you're, it's, he spoke a lie. Other times you're just keeping silent, uh, keeping a private uh, position. You're not being honest with people, letting them think maybe you're agreeing with them, but you really don't, but you won't say it. That's also dishonest. So whatever you want to think about me, uh, I'm honest. I'm going to tell you the positions I hold, and I make playlists on them, and I ask you, watch the playlist. Consider it. Maybe you're wrong. Is it possible? Have you ever been wrong about anything? All right, let's uh, go ahead and respond to anything, brother, and I'll, I'll look through the chat room some more. Um, When... Uh, like the second death, uh, I think that's what you're talking about, right, uh, Brother Luke? The what? The, the second death you're talking about? Oh, yeah, the second, second death is uh, what I'm referring to. Is that, uh, uh, you know, again, I, I have made probably about, uh, you know, six, seven, eight, ten hours of video explaining everything about this. So I'm not going to be able to do it in a few minutes to do it justice. You need to really go to the playlist and to get a complete explanation. But uh, I was, Jesus said, do not fear uh, he who can destroy your body, but fear God who can destroy both body and soul in hell. Uh, destroy body and soul. And John 3.16 says, uh, For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There's two possibilities for all of humanity, everlasting life or perish. Perish doesn't mean that you would continue to exist forever, being tortured. Perish means you don't exist. Perish. Uh, also, uh, um, in Deuteronomy well, too there's many, there's many other verses but also the second death is, is what Jesus is referring to both body and soul all of humanity gets resurrected brother you and I are going to go to the um, judgment seat of Christ to get rewarded for our ministry works those who never received an eternal life they go to the great white throne judgment because they never got eternal life I think what's going to happen is the books will be opened. Everything will be revealed. They'll reflect on their whole life and see all their sin. They'll see every sin, one right after another, put on Jesus, another, another, all on Jesus, all on Jesus. Jesus paid for all their sins. He, but even though he paid for their sins, they would not accept his salvation. They rejected him his, their whole life. They would not receive the gift of eternal life. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That's referring to the second death. And the gift of God is eternal life. Now, if we all have eternal life innately, we're born with eternal life and eternal soul, then this, it would be absolutely unnecessary for anybody to go to Jesus to get the gift of eternal life since we already have it. So I think at this judgment for the lost, God will be showing him his mercy and justice. Look, I gave you so many chances your whole life uh, look all the opportunities you had to 
seek me out and people try to tell you about me and you wouldn't want to listen you wouldn't believe and you wouldn't receive the gift and you're, you don't have eternal life and you wouldn't accept it so you're dying now they die and then they're put in the lake of fire and they just are consumed the fire consumes them that's how i believe that's how i interpret all of this that's the second death Um, I also wanted to say, too, I think in Deuteronomy, I think um, God says, choose this day, uh, life or death. And um, I can't remember the whole verse. I remember reading that and going, wait a minute. Is he talking about eternal death and eternal life? Or is he talking about the physical consequences of this life that can lead on to death, the first the physical death, the you know, um, so I was trying to think of that. I'm trying to remember exactly where it is. And I think it's in Deuteronomy. And I just remember reading that going, what the heck? <laughs> and um, the more I started reading into the whole death uh, and life, uh, God is black and white on it. I mean, um, I, I watched your playlist. I, I was watching it and I was like, oh, Okay, so that's a big possibility. And then I also saw uh, Doug, I think it was Doug Batchelor you had, you had on your playlist, if I remember correctly. Um, uh, I, I used to watch him, uh, gosh, uh, it was a while back, but um, I remember him talking about that too, that, you, you know, you're gonna be, that they're going to be thrown in the lake of fire that's eternally separated, which is eternal death. You're, you're not going to be, you're not going to have um, eternal torment. It's straight up. You're gone. It's not, it's not, Hey, you're going to be in there and in, in hell forever and ever and ever. We're, uh, we're mortal. We're not immortal. Only God gives immortality. And that's through his son, Jesus Christ. So, I, I can see where you're coming from on that. I, I'm still kind of reading into it a little more because I'm still not sure. But it seems like it is going towards that the more and more I'm reading into it. Yeah. I just wanted uh, to say you know, that. Uh, uh, the, um, apart from uh, biblical doctrine, the, the, the foundation of our congregation, what we call the Church of the Eternally Secure, is, is this creed uh, it's an ancient creed. Um, I embraced it, and then I found out that Matthias also embraced it, and we decided to work together under this creed. And that is, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, in all things, charity. And so we said, we need to unite. Uh, there are some things that are core doctrines that are essential that we have to get right. And... Uh, and then there are many other things that uh, everything in the Bible is important, but they don't rise to the level of importance that we, we have to be dogmatic. A dogma means that um, you better agree with me or else. I, we will not tolerate another viewpoint on this. And uh, we have three dogmas, deity of Christ, faith alone for salvation, eternal security. These are something that there's no room for compromise. We are dogmatic. And then eternal torment, which Bible translation, how end times is going to play out, eschatological things, and a hundred other things. Um, these are all interesting. I, I love all these subjects, and I have probably opinions. Some of them are strong, and some of them are, you know, relatively strong. Uh, and, but none of them are dogmas. So I would say the fourth dogma for the Church of the Eternally Secure is you cannot have a fourth dogma. If someone said, you've got to uh, uh, believe in eternal torment, or if someone said, you've got to believe eternal torment is a false doctrine, and no, I'd say, no, they, we're not gonna be dogmatic on that. There's room for other uh, and opinions, interpretations on these other subjects. So I'm happy that you're considering it. As I said, for 25 years, uh, I wasn't, didn't know much about any other position and when I finally decided, I was confronted. 
I was confronted by my best friend coming up with this crazy idea, contrary to everything I ever believed and was taught. And my best friend, I, I needed to straighten him out. So I listened to him and tried to argue with him. But I lost the argument. And I think that's what people are going to be confronted with. If they watch any of my playlists that, that, that have a different position than them, you will be confronted with another possible answer. And I believe the conclusions I've come to on many of these cases, the conclusion is so com compelling that you're going to be confronted with, now that I hear the other side, I can see that it, it's not possible that I was right. I have to change my, my position. That's the position I found myself in a few times. Well, nobody else wants to join us, uh, brother. I keep posting the link here. I'll post it again. Uh, I thought after last Friday's program, everybody was so gung-ho about uh, everybody participating and being able to participate in the panel and and that uh, these Friday night programs would be so, we look forward to them so much now, but it's, no one wants to join, I guess, but that, that's okay. I, I could talk by myself all night, as you know, but I'd rather have a conversation than a lecture. Yeah, I hear you on that. Um, and also, it was in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, uh, where it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. Uh -huh. So I was kind of wondering, um, from reading that, um, is that talking about eternal life? I or is that talking I don't about I'd physical? Have back, I'd have to go back to Deuteronomy and read it all in context to figure that out. I don't know. Uh, uh, okay. It doesn't. It doesn't come to mind. It's, it's not one of those verses that uh, I've used, or that it, whether you're on either side of this question, that's not one of the verses either side uses. Read it. Say it, say it one more time. Yes. Are you going to say it one more time, Esteban? You still yeah, uh, yeah, I'm right here. Hold on. I was just trying to find. I'm, I actually closed my book real quick. Sorry. I, uh, hold on. Let's see if I can. I'm trying to get right back to it. Um, it's okay. Here it is. It says, uh, I call heaven and earth to, to rec uh, record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both you and your seed may live. And then uh, if, I, if you want me to read further down to 20, I can also do that. And no, it says, I, I just don't think that's a, that verse applies to this, this subject, really. I don't, I don't see. Uh, well, why do you see in that verse that makes you think that's about eternal torment or perishing? Because, well, the reason why I think that is because he says, I call heaven and earth to rec record this day against you that I have set before you life, which I think could represent eternal life. And then it says, and death blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both you and your seed may live. Uh, I don't know. I just something in me. Uh, maybe I, I'm wrong. That, that's in context. I'm guessing that's probably has to do with something with the, the, the ethnic groups fighting at that time. And, the, the geographical battles, uh, probably, but I don't know. Um, we got. Let me see, Reverend Doctor. Uh, hello, I um, I haven't seen you here in the congregation before. Welcome. Um, I, I guess you uh, you must have read the statement of faith and and agree with it because I, I stated that as a prerequisite to join oh. the, the panel. No, no, no. I'm sorry about that. I didn't realize that. No, I saw the link, and uh, you had asked. And I'm no, I've never been here before. I think I might have seen you five or ten years ago, so I apologize. No, I, I didn't read the statement of faith. Well, let me let me just ask you the, uh, uh, the post I put here uh, be, with this link is if you completely agree with our statement of faith, oh. then you are invited to join the live panel by using the following link. Oh, oh uh, I'm sorry, that was uh, the statement of faith. Uh, 
the three core doctrines, Jesus is eternal God Almighty. Uh, salvation is by faith alone in Christ alone. We are not required to have any religious works for our salvation and eternal security. Do you disagree with any of those three points? Um, no, I don't, I don't actually believe. I was just checking things out and you had said about... Um, oh, you're not a believer. No, I apologize. No, I'm sorry. I didn't read it. That's my fault. Okay. Well, then uh, I guess I just invite you to uh, participate in the... Uh, the the, sure. Uh, room. Uh, everybody's welcome in the chat room. Uh, yeah. I, just, I don't let anybody even in the chat room. Uh, right. Yeah. Uh, argue for the actual core doctrines, but uh, the panel uh, is a, a, we have to agree on these core doctrines, and the chat room is anybody can participate as long as they're not teaching uh, against our core doctrines. That's all. No, well, that's fine. No, I felt bad for the guy. Said he was. Is I'm glad to hear he's doing better with anxiety and. Um, and I know you were talking about hell and some different doctrines and anyhow, I, I don't want to mess you up if I didn't read the things. So, okay. I'm sorry. All right. All right. Well, well, you're welcome to hang around in the chat room. No, that's okay. No, I, I, I really have stuff to do, but take care. Have a good night. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, let's go say, yes, to buy. I think that verse you are going, quoting is about choosing to keep the law. Esteban Rich Bob says, I have to say, Esteban, I think that verse you are quoting is about choosing to keep the law. Uh, that's what I would say. Uh, but um, the, see, the thing is, all the verses that people use to refute perishing, I've heard them many times. And all the verses that we use to support perishing, uh, I, I'm familiar with those. That verse is not used for either side, so therefore it, it, it can't. I, I'm that's why I'm saying I, th I, that's out of context. The context has got to be what Rich Bob is saying about the law, or what I said about maybe the you know the being blessed or saved by a war or saved from war from the enemies of, in that uh, geographical area. That's probably the context of it. Um, actually, yeah, I think you guys are right on that because I read a little further down and it was telling you, you may love the Lord, your God, and that you may obey his voice, uh, and that you may cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days that you may dwell in the land, which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob to give them. So that was in verse 20. So, uh, yeah, I think you guys were right on that. Yeah, um, you know, um, I don't want to mention anybody's name right now, uh, but uh, but uh, there there is one of our brethren that is uh, uh, I've talked to about th this air, this particular um, air of um, in the in the principle of Bible study and formulating doctrine. We, we there are certain rules we follow, and of course context everybody's going to be united. Yeah, the context is essential. Uh, but another one is, what was the intention of the writer at the time? That's preeminent. Uh, the writer had uh, was talking to a particular group of people at a particular time in history based on a particular scenario that existed. And we have to understand all that to, to understand what he's intending to convey. Uh, and, and then what you don't want to do is, unfortunately, I've seen some people doing this, and that is you have a position and then you do a word search for a key word that, will, so that your position's about. And then you find any, all the verses that contain that key word and pull them out of context and, and use those verses to support your position. There's a saying that a verse taken out of context is a pretext. Now, sometimes it's 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 an innocent mistake. Sometimes it's it's malicious and dishonest and intended to be misused. Uh, but um, yeah, we we can't just pull a verse out and 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 uh, apply it to something that was not the intention of the writer at the time. Um, but to me, uh, the the principle of context and the intention of the writer. Uh, are, are most important except one other thing, I guess, supersedes all others. And that is that our conclusions have to be based on verses that are clear and explicit, not ambiguous. 
And our conclusion should be based upon, is that point repeated? If, if the Bible clearly states something and it, and it cannot have any other meaning, and then that, that point is being made over and over and again, for example, salvation by faith alone, I can give you 300 verses that explicitly say you're saved by faith alone in one of two ways. Therefore, we conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. That's saying you're justified by faith alone without the law. That's that's completely, uh, couldn't be construed any other way. And then you have John 3.16 says faith alone. Why? Because it says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. There is nothing else included except believing. That's believing alone, isn't it? If, if the verse is not saying believing plus anything else, therefore it's saying it's only telling you to believe. So we have um, over 300 verses uh, that clearly state we're saved by faith alone without any works. Uh, and, and it's clearly stated and it's repeated hundreds of times. That doctrine you should be able to trust. But if we take verses that are ambiguous and, and rare, and to, to, to try to support a position, it's very easy uh, to uh, come to a wrong conclusion or, and also it can be used by the enemy uh, maliciously. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, I mean, the, I mean, the, even in like John... What's the wow to? Uh, huh? We said wow. What was the wow to? Just like, yeah, we shouldn't be doing it um, out of context and stuff. And I, I, I shouldn't have just read you one verse that wasn't that wasn't right. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that was my bad. It was my fault for that. Yeah. So. But I, I mean, if we know the context, like when John 3, 16, we know the context of that, that verse. John chapter 3, hopefully everybody here knows the context of that chapter. Uh, so, uh, I mean, sometimes you study it, you know the context, it's okay to use it because you're familiar with the context. But if you don't know the context and you're using the verse and we have to research and let's figure out what the context is, well, perhaps you shouldn't have used it if you weren't aware that the context is the proper one. Yeah, that's true. Um, Does anyone think it's inherently disturbing when you see religious folks quote from James more often than any other book in the Bible? Uh, Hendrix. Hendrix. <laughs> uh, let's ask Esteban that. Esteban? Does it disturb you when you see people who are religious? They're the Christians who are religious Christians. Uh, they seem to love the book of James uh, more so than any other book. Does that bother you? Uh, it, it, it depends like with the whole context and like you were saying. Uh, if you're pulling out a context like a lot of them do, yeah, it, it bugs me a little bit. Um, but then I understand because I used to be one of those uh, religious uh, do works uh, kind of people. Um, I used to do that, you see, before I got saved. And um, the, when, I, when I read it, I tried to explain it, like another viewpoint of it that I saw. And um, I mean, when they get angry with you and you try to just... You just want to be calm with them, and you're just trying to show them, hey, it's okay. Yeah, I see your viewpoint. I'm just saying this is what I see, um, but they don't want to hear it. Then it really kind of it just it, it kind of um, how do I say this word? Uh, it bugs me. It does. It bugs me a little bit because I'm like, I hear your viewpoint, but why can't you hear mine? I'm trying to show you something that maybe you that you haven't seen or something, but I, I can't talk my my own viewpoint on that. Uh, it doesn't make any sense. So that's just what I have to say about that. Um, what do you think? Well, the, the, the key to Hendrix's question is this word religious, uh, uh, 
religious folks. Now, I know what he means by religious folks, the people who not, do not believe as we do that, that we're not saved by being religious. These people believe that they're saved by being religious, by practicing religion and uh, by the, the things that they do. And so those are the people that use James. Mormons use it at their favorite book. Uh, Catholics will use it uh, and, and Lordship heretics use it. And that's, that's the book they want to quote more. So now you can find problem texts uh, in, in many other books, but, but James is the penultimate book for the Lordship heresy. So the problem is uh, uh, like uh, Rene uh, and, and brother Jason Jack, uh, they have a really, they're, they're some of the best I've ever seen at explaining the book of James in a way that I find um, uh, acceptable, even though I think it's the wrong way to understand it, it's acceptable to me because uh, they're not using the book of James to argue that works are required for salvation as a lordship heretic does. They're, they're, they're saying the, exactly the opposite and they're doing the best they can to support that. Uh, and just that my position is that Think about this. Everybody listening now who's actually read the whole Bible, or at least you've read the whole New Testament, and you're reading Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, especially, you get to John, and you're just thrilled. That's what happened to me. I, I got thrilled. I got saved when I read John. This is when I had this joy and assurance of my salvation. And that's why John was written. John says he wrote the book to teach us how to get be saved. And uh, and then we get to Acts. Well, okay, uh, I had no no problem in Acts. There are problems in Acts, but uh, it wasn't like it wasn't breaking uh, shocking to me. I uh, we get to James, and all of a sudden, wait a second. Uh, this is a uh, this is totally different. Now, if you have the benefit of uh, listening to Jason Jack or Renee and others that do a good job of trying to make sense of it, trying to make it fit, trying to make it actually agree with John, then, then a person is fortunate if they have the benefit of that teaching from them. But the people who don't have that benefit, uh, it's very for easy for them to read James and be shocked and say, he's saying the exact opposite of, of what... Uh, I've been reading in John, and uh, instead of uh, having this joy, now I'm having my doubts and I'm worried. Man, have, have I? Do I have enough works? And my position is, instead of trying to re-explain what James is saying, reinterpret it to make it agree, uh, I just accept that James was saying what he said. I believe James was one of the most educated and um, um, articulate of, of, of all the, 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 the writers. You know, if you study Bible history, he was called James the Just, and, and he was elevated, even some elevated him above Jesus, historically, that he was so righteous, so, so great. Uh, so, um, and, I believe this James, I believe he was the brother of Jesus, and he got his position kind of inherited because of family line. He was esteemed in that way, but he was uh, uh, articulate. I believe he could write a sentence exactly what he wanted to say and make it very clear. So I think when he, say, he says that uh, we're, we're, we're saved or we're justified by works, and not by faith only. I don't believe that he's saying something other than that. I believe he's saying exactly what he means. And, and if you look at James being the first book that was penned in the New Testament, the earliest one penned, and then after that, you have Galatians. And you compare Galatians and James, it's almost like uh, Paul says, uh, we're, 
you're justified by uh, by um, believing uh and, and you're justified in god's sight by believing and james says you're not justified by by believing only by but by uh by what you what you do the, these uh, i have a playlist called james and paul the shocking facts and i at one point in one of those videos I do a, a little dramatic skit and I do something like this. I say, I say, when I'm wearing the hat, it's Paul speaking. When I take the hat off, it's James speaking. Okay. I say, you're justified by works and not by faith only. We conclude a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. I mean, uh, and, and the, the video goes on probably about a dozen verses showing that it's it's like an argument going back and forth between them over this, the necessity of works. And then I also show in a, a variety of playlists, this transition that the church had to go through the first um, a few decades, uh, getting away from Judaism, thinking that Judaism is a requirement, practicing Judaism was required to, to be a Christian, you had to practice Judaism. And so all of that together is putting all these puzzle pieces together to make me conclude that, no, James and Paul were, were not in agreement. There was a dispute going on. Paul expressed one side, James expressed the other side. And uh, uh, so I believe when James wrote that book, he wrote exactly what he really meant. And it's easy to understand the very first time you read it, what he's telling us, except that we have a lot of really good teachers like Renee and Jason Jack and many others that uh, they're not using it the way the Lordship would to support works are needed for salvation. They're able to explain it another way. So I accept it, but it's not the way I think that it was the intended intention of James when he wrote it. Um, so one thing with uh, James chapter two, and um, when I went from, verses 21 through 26 i compared it to romans uh chapter 4 and uh it sounded like it was talking about the finished work of christ when i started reading it and uh so that was my um viewpoint on it um that's just something i thought you know when i was reading it so i thought it was interesting uh, well, the thing is, uh, what I'm doing right now, this is extemporaneous. Every once in a while, I like to use a, a big word like that. I'm just talking off the top of my head. I don't have notes in front of me. I haven't prepared a formal presentation on this. Uh, but on my playlist, when I made those videos, a lot of study, a lot of organization of thoughts were, were put together so that I could um, present it in a cohesive way. And uh, so to be fair to the subject and to fair, be fair yourself, Esteban, and all others, watch the playlist carefully and consider it and uh, that not don't make a decision based upon me just extemporaneously expounding on it right now. Hello, Brother Alex. Can you hear me? Hello, Brother Luke. Yes, blessings, Brother Alex. Do you have a, a praise report for us? Well, um, yes, I'm glad to be alive. I was hit last morning by a kid in a scooter and then I had a root canal the same day oh, uh, yeah. and uh, well praise report is on um, they're going to give me my apartment soon I'm staying at the home of a, a family uh, friends of mine uh, brothers from church so uh, that's one of the praise reports I got many but um, I'm Pretty happy to, to be alive at this moment. Yeah, yeah. Well, certainly we're all happy you're you're alive with us. But you know, as I said, when we first went live, uh, or not when when Esteban first joined me, he asked me how I was, and I was. Yeah. Well, how, how are you doing? Well, I, I I said that at the beginning, and again, if I say it again, it's I, I'm always worried that I I'm going to. Uh, when I when I boast of, of my happiness and my and my blessings, uh, 
then I, I, I always worry that those who are going through problems, it's going to actually make them feel bad because, you know, they're, they're, they're going through something so difficult and I'm just so happy. So I, I, I have a, I'm conflicted, but uh, I would say that I'm just really happy, really happy. I'm, uh, I'll give okay. Since this this program really, I the intention was to make it praise reports, not a doctrine or a Bible teaching thing. But we uh, we didn't have a large panel here praising Jesus uh, tonight, so it turned into discussing some doctrines. But I'm glad you're here, and, and we we can start praising Jesus now. But uh, I will say that. Uh, the medical procedures that I've gone through are helping me. And uh, some of the, the, the study that I've done the last few years on uh, trying to get healthy, the th changes I've made in my, my life uh, have, have worked out very well. Uh, I'm feeling really, really healthier in many ways. And just uh, so I'm, I'm just happy. I, I, I actually go to my wife throughout the day and say, Cindy, I don't, I, I, I'm so happy. I'm giddy. Praise God. That's awesome, Brother Luke. Uh, and uh, I said, I said, do you think I might be manic depressive? Because I get these overwhelming periods of joy. But but she said, well, you're not depressive. No, I don't. I don't go through like a high and a low. I go through uh, a happy and an exhilarated, happy, exhilarated. I'm, it's not. I don't ever get into the low, but I just I have these moments where I get so happy that I just feel I got to tell someone. So I, my wife's here, so I tell her. And now I'm telling you, brother. And I'm, 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 another reason I'm happy is that you're here with us and that, that you survived this uh, problem you had to deal with today. Yes, glad to join you because I've been like uh, in and out of uh, YouTube lately because of this uh, gypsy situation that I'm going through. But uh, praise God, I also have like... Uh, this place to stay with my friends. They're very dear to me. Um, he's uh, the guitar player in church, so we get along very well. So um, I've been very blessed. Sometimes I've been able to watch, but not even comment on the chat like very much. But yeah, there's always a reason to praise God. And I disagree with you that if someone is discouraged, maybe would feel encouraged to to feel praise reports from you or how you are feeling or what the Lord can do. Because many times we take things for granted, just like walking to take the subway, you can get hit by someone and life can change dramatically in a second. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, when we had that little fellowship room going, I was in there quite often with you and was having a great time with you and Esteban and Mark and others. And um, unfortunately, though, that got um, the environment got a little caustic and ugly, and I I, I couldn't tolerate it. Uh, that's why right right here, um, there are certain people that are blocked uh, that and, and that I have zero tolerance for uh, profanities, vulgarities, hatefulness, uh, personal attacks, and stuff, and and so I, I won't have any of it. And and so I missed the fellowship with you, brother Alex. And, and the others, uh, but as I said, I, I won't enter a, an atmosphere that's caustic. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, Hendrix, Hendrix, Leo Lars, Hendrix, you are a very calm, upright brother. Hey, brother Leo, hit that link and join us if you're able, brother Leo, or anybody else. I post the link. Here's it. I'll post it again. Control V, enter. Yeah, anybody who uh, wants to join us, uh, all those who agree with our core doctrines, with our statement of faith, uh, you're invited to click on that and, and join the, the panel if you like. Uh, and if anybody has any praise uh, reports in the chat room, you can either come on here or just tell us in the chat room. We'd like to know about it. I mean, come on. Do we have a, a, a great Savior God, Jesus? Is, is he worthy of our praise? Can anybody come up with anything to be thankful for tonight? I can be thankful for my life. Because uh, without him, he's the only one that's actually keeping us all alive right now. Without him, we, we, we would be dead. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think, is it 
Job, or is it Ecclesiastes? That, that every breath we have is God. God is responsible even for every breath we have. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that. I mean, if anybody knows if there's a verse about that, I, I think there is. Yes, all of our hair uh, hairs counted, all the hairs of our head. He's like in control of everything. He uh, names the stars by name. So yeah, people get they take things for granted, like breathing, for example, and they can't decide if they're going to breathe tomorrow. So yeah, at the end of well, the day, uh, sometimes right. I complain a lot. I must admit, but at the end of the day, when I say a prayer I, I look back and, and i see how he has uh, he holds me all the time even when i'm not aware god is good yeah yeah uh liberally conservative just wrote i'm thankful my test came back negative for pancreas cancer praise jesus yes wow very happy for you for, for that report that's that's wonderful huh? You know, I, I got some news here. Think, Go ahead. I'm sorry, I can think of um, of a grace report of a, a little child that he's seven years old, that he had uh, cancer, and his name is Bruno. We were praying for him at church, and now he's doing okay. We saw a picture from him, and they were thankful for the prayers. And uh, I get a lot of good news there, like, for example, a few years ago, there was another friend of ours that had uh, colon cancer. And uh, the doctors said he was going to, two doctors said, not only one, they told him uh, they operated the tumor and it went away, but they were, there was something um, that it could have metastasized anyway. And uh, they told him that they, he would need like at least 12 chemotherapies. And... Uh, he didn't, and uh, I suddenly, we were like having tea, you know, and um, it just came out of my mouth. Let's pray so they you don't go through chemotherapy. And then I was like, wow, what did I just say? Lord, help me. And the sister, like, she seconded me and she said, yes, amen, Alex, let's pray for that. And we prayed, and uh, that was like six years ago. And things that happened in that chat, and we prayed and prayed, and the doctors just had to admit it was a miracle. Mm -hmm. And mm. They, he didn't need not not one chemo, not even one. Well, I got a, a praise report and a prayer request. I'll give everybody now that. Uh, let me see. I think it was last weekend. Let me see. Uh, no, it was the it was the twenty uh, fourth and twenty fifth of May. Um, we had a big uh, event happen here in Las Vegas, uh, the fiftieth uh, reunion for my college fraternity. And uh, there are some of my, my friends I made in college in the fraternity that have remained my friends here in Las Vegas for fifty years. There's a few of them. Uh, some of them are very close friends and then many others that are uh, still acquaintances. And then some of them have moved all the way across the country, but some of them I haven't seen for 50 years. So we went to this 50 year reunion and I got to see a lot of people uh, and I got three reports uh, of, that are, are these people are uh, believers. Uh, uh, one, I knew was a believer many years ago, and and another one uh, I knew was a believer ten years ago, and then the the other one I only found out that they're a believer recently, so I was really happy about that. But let me tell you about my oldest friend. This one goes back all the way to high school. Um, he got married uh, when I was in college. When it was about 1972, I think, and uh, he got married and. Uh, his wife was a, a Christian and, and he became a believer and I was not a believer, but Billy Graham came to Las Vegas and did a crusade about 1972 or three. And I didn't even know he was in town, but my friend Don and Jan Walker, they, uh, 
they are going to go to that crusade and ask me to go. So I went with them. And I listened, and, and then he did an altar call, and I went forward to the altar, and I did the prayer and all the stuff. And um, I, I, Reflecting on it, uh, I, I know I wasn't saved that night because even the gospel message that was presented by Billy Graham wasn't the real gospel, but it was, a, it was a, an important part of my life to, to, to do that and have that experience and reflect on it now. So Don and Jan, they, they wanted me to be a believer even back then. And it wasn't until about 14 years later, in 1986, that I believed. Uh, wow. So uh, they were believers long before me, Don and Jan. So now Don, they moved away from Las Vegas about 10 years ago to Tennessee. And Don shows up at the... 50 year reunion and I see him after all these years I hadn't seen him and it was wonderful except that I got some heartbreaking news that his wife died three weeks ago three weeks before and they were married 47 years and and now and then I find out from him that he's just recently diagnosed with terminal lung cancer oh my god so I'm heartbroken uh, because the time in his life he needs his wife more than ever before sure. she's gone she's with the lord he's alone he need, he needs his wife now he's got family with him helping him but now he needs his wife more than ever and she's already departed to be with the lord uh, but but we're we were both don and i both are very very happy that we got to see each other this time and uh i know we'll see each other at the Amen. the, the the wedding supper of the lamb and i look forward to seeing him there and having that big feast with him that's my friend and brother dawn but i'm asking everybody to pray for dawn uh, god is still healing and still doing miracles and uh, this lung cancer is an easy thing god can just like that and it's gone amen pray, and, and, pray for yeah. my brother and friend dawn walker's healing we'll pray for dawn like no doubt because uh, to force ourselves to pray, for example, we have in this app uh, for uh, a prayer calendar. So Tuesdays, we pray for uh, evangelism and for all the missionaries, including um, those that have sound doctrine that are on, on the Internet. And, of course, all my YouTube friends. Um, and that includes you, of course. So... We're, they're, you're all in, in, in that package and all the prayers and all the baggage that uh, all the viewers also have uh, are prayed for. Mm. So we're going to pray for Don. Yeah. Okay, Leo Larson wants me to send the link by email. Okay, I, I just scrolled back and saw it just now, Leo. That you probably posted it five minutes ago, but let me send it to you. Uh, yeah, he can't get it, I guess, through the chat room. Uh, I got Brother Leo's email address, though. Brother Luke, what happened to me as I tried to press the link, uh, it just took me to to open the app. I mean, it, it took me to the app like as if it was not installed, I mean. Really? Yeah, it didn't take me directly. Well, in fact, I'm not a computer nerd. I can barely get by on my phone. And I'm on my phone now. I don't even know how I'm going to get out of the Hangouts. But uh, when we did the interview, I remember it worked just fine. But yeah, I works. noticed that that happened on the other time. Uh, I couldn't join, but I well, checked you did out. Right, because uh, we can hear you fine, and uh, your camera was on when you first came on. Uh huh. Oh, and yeah, I can't see myself now. Oh, there I am. See, yeah. I there you are. I don't know how to. How to put the other picture on. Yeah, it's up to you. Whether you want you can... the camera or not. I'm just used to using the camera. I like to okay. show off. What do you see now, for example? My good health now. The thing is, uh, this 10 years on YouTube, the funny thing about it is that if you go through my videos 10 years ago and look at, just, just look at the picture of me on each one of them for 10 years 
And you'll see me, I was 270 pounds. Hey, brother Leo. Hi. Yeah. Hello, brother. Glad you could join us on this Fellowship Friday. <laughs> it's cool, man. I, I, uh, I actually just randomly saw it. I was, we, we got back from um, uh, visiting my sister-in-law. She was graduating high school today. She got her diploma. And, uh, and so when I, uh, we just got back home right now, I was walking my dog and I'm looking on YouTube. It's like, oh, there's a live thing going on. Cool. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, great. Well, uh, I don't know if you've seen this, uh, Leo, but if you actually go to my videos and you don't watch, don't watch the video, but just look at the picture. All my videos, I don't have any icons on 99.9. On .9, there's no icon on the video. It's just a picture of my face usually. Right. And uh, if you look at my face on those videos, you'll see me at 270 pounds and I have no facial features. Because I'm, my face is so overweight that it's, it's like a bowling ball. There's I, no I, I've yeah. seen them. <laughs> and then if you go through them, the next video, the next video, you can see that there's a period where I went and I lost a lot of weight. And I got I actually lost so much weight, my face was like emaciated and I looked like I was 90. And my wife says, you've lost too much weight. You better. So I gained some weight back. But it's really a record of, you know, about two videos a week for 10 years. So... There's a there's a record of my look how I look for over this ten year period. Uh, you could actually you know how they make those uh, little uh, books where they have a picture and they you you you, uh, you fan the picture and it looks like yeah. it's moving. You can yeah. you can actually do that with my pictures and see my face aging. I mean I mean oh getting thinner and thinner and then heavier and so on. Be funny to do that. <laughs> well, you know what I was I was a vegan for five years and. Um, about a year ago, I decided to start eating meat again because oh, wow. I was going to that local church down uh, down the street. Over over, it was last summer actually, last summer. And this this old man said, "Hey, there's going to be this uh, uh, men's retreat. You want my ticket? I can't go." I said, "Oh, all right, sure." So I accepted it, and there was nothing but. You know, red meat. All they had was red meat, red meat. Finally, I gave in, and man, I've been hooked ever since. And I, I actually gained like twenty pounds. So I'm, I'm 190 pounds, but a year ago I was like one, one, 165. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of us, you know, uh, we we want to and we need to lose weight, and uh, we're struggling trying to figure out how to do it. And then some two people, uh, we lose too much, and and we're trying to find that uh, happy medium is. Uh, a challenge. Uh, I went through, uh, uh, you know, I watch YouTube videos every day, all day long. I'll, I'll, and I watch them on different subjects. I watch a lot of flat earth videos still. I, I watch a lot of nutrition videos and I watch Bible videos. Those are the three subjects I spend my most of my time watching. And uh, on the nutrition, I've gone through this thing where I've transitioned to a, a low carb diet and then an extremely low carb diet called ketogenic. And then uh, uh, now even an extremely, extremely low carb that they call carnivore, which is almost no carbs at all. And nice. uh, the, the more carbs I get out of my diet, the better I feel, the happier, the better I am. If anybody is interested in those, you could just, you could find them on YouTube. There's tons of information on it, but I believe for me and for many people, I think getting plant life out of our diet for the most part is going to be, help your health. The other thing I recommend is delaying our first meal as long as possible every day. Instead of waking up and eating, delay it till 10 and then learn to delay it till noon and then to learn to delay it till 2. The longer you can delay it each day, uh, that fasting period is, is going, has a lot of health benefits. And mm. plus, if you delay it, you end up eating less calories throughout the in the remainder of the day and uh, you keep your calories lower and you're going to lose weight too. So delay eating each day, eat, limit your, 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 animal, uh, your, your, your uh, plant life, get plant life out of your diet. <laughs> this sounds crazy. I know. Uh, and then lift weights. Yeah. Those are the three things that I recommend. If you do those three things, it, uh, probably the three best tips I can give people for to, for uh, getting your health. Yeah, sounds good.
You know, I, well, I, I have to admit, I feel so much better that I've been, I, I went back to eating meat. I mean, I grew up on eating meat. Is this something that I got freaked out with probably, probably about, you know, over five years? I was getting, I, I got, you know, sick a few times and it grossed me out. And I said, screw it, no more meat. I went to the extreme. And I, yeah. And I just, I, you know what? I had no zero energy and, and I, and I got real weak and I lost the, I, I lost, Wait, but I, I didn't have that drive that I that I, you know, I'm feeling again now, you know, and uh, I'll tell you, if my mental capacity is much greater than when I was vegan, you know, I can yeah. think better. I can I can focus for longer periods of time. Hey, uh, I, I can hear you, but I think it'd be better if you could try to get a little closer to your speaker. Your microphone, okay. your microphone, a little bit better. But look, we got here, uh, Sarah Jane says, breakfast means break your fast. Yeah. So whenever you eat your first meal of the day, you're breaking your fast. Uh, I used to break my fast when I wake up in the morning, and I learned how to break my fast now. Usually noon or one or two is when I break my fast and have my first meal. And uh, so I mean, Golgotha says, I delay usually until lunch between 12 and 4. I, yeah, I think, and this fasting, of course, we know uh, the, the Bible tells us that there's benefits in fasting, but uh, there's all kinds of uh, health benefits uh, besides the spiritual benefits of fasting. Uh, sure, those spiritual so, uh, benefits have to be directed anyway. What's that? I mean, those spirit, uh, the spiritual activity has to be or orientated in the fast. I mean, it has to be orientated that way. It has to align with scripture or to singing. Well, yeah, prayer and fasting. Yeah, if you're just fasting and you don't have prayer, but I would it's assume. No meeting. Yeah, it doesn't work. Sure. Yeah, maybe, maybe I'm assuming too much, but I assume that in the congregation here, that if they if they start incorporating some fasting, that they're already praying. So they're going to have prayer and fasting because if they're praying now and then they add the fasting to it, they'll have the prayer and fasting. I, I mean, I hope we're all praying. Aren't you? Are you praying all day, everybody? I hope you're praying continually. Well, we know we know uh, one who who that one person that is is interceding with the Father constantly. Yes, Jesus Christ, beside you. Yeah, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> hey, you know there's another reason to thank him. Thank you, Jesus, for your intercessory prayers for us. It's great. We can we can all have you know. It, it, prayer doesn't have to be so, uh, you know. I guess you would say so religious. I mean, everybody has their own way of praying. Praying, but me personally, I like praying right up here. I'm like speaking to God constantly. Not constantly, but I, a lot of times when something happens, boom! I'm speaking to God right away already having a conversation right here because i know the the spirit can can hear you know the spirit lives inside of you yeah yeah exactly uh, praying without ceasing it means like in any time like when you're on the bus on the subway when you're walking doing dishes yeah he's there all the time yeah, yeah. i i uh you know we've we've talked a lot about prayer uh, over year, the years in our programs but I think it's always good to remind people, the Bible does tell us to continually pray. The verse, the way I like it best is how Paul expressed it. He said, continue instant in prayer. Now, I think that Paul should have, or the translator should have translated it as an adverb. And that is continue instantly back into your prayer. In other words, and I do this. Uh, I, again, I, I feel guilty. I feel uh, self-conscious anytime I uh, say something about myself because I don't want to be um, ever construed as uh, self-righteous. But I, uh, I wake up, I'm praying. The, as soon as I wake up, I'm praying. And uh, now the prayer should be going on all day unless it's interrupted by a task. And that's why if we're continually praying and then right now are, are you are, i'm not praying because i'm thinking about what i'm saying to you you guys are, i don't think you're praying right now because you're 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 focused on listening to me but as soon as as soon as our minds are freed from whatever our the task at hand is we should continue instantly back in the prayer to god that should be the default and the routine of our life 
Uh, do I do it perfectly all day long? I'm sorry to confess I don't, but that's what I, I strive for. Amen. Anybody, anybody else want to boast about themselves? <laughs> well, I just keep I'm, boasting I'm, I'm about God. Humbled, I'm pretty humble to do that, I'm, I must say. And, uh, I'm, I'm older than many people in the chat room, so it means that I've been humbler for a long time than yeah well, you know it's just my nature <laughs> just kidding <laughs> yeah he's boasting of his humility isn't that hilarious <laughs> <laughs> i love it that's it yeah remember yeah. paul said he would rather boast in his infirmities you know exactly like, yeah okay? there's nothing that dwells nothing in this body that dwells good other than jesus christ <laughs> amen i love second corinthians when um, it, it, the thorn in the flesh that that part because that we can also use as a testimony that his power is perfected in our weaknesses and That's right many people boast on how they don't need the lord but i always say that i do that i'm an Im imperfect without him that's great. Yeah. You know, we should all have that lowliness of mind and not think of ourselves any better than anyone else, even those that don't have Christ living inside of them. We should, you know, that, that's the, that's the cool thing is that's that's why no one can point the finger because we are not pointing the fingers at anyone else. You know, exactly. And it's, it's funny because the, the two edged sword, um, I used to see it in a vertical way when I used to, when I started getting in a little bit religious and self-righteous, it was like pointing and, and cutting my nose too. I saw like a, a vision of it like that, that way. Like, I don't know, wow. uh, I don't drink anymore, but you are drinking. Well, I was never like that, you know, but uh, when I started like on that path, like immediately I saw this image of the, of the double-edged sword in my nose too. That's a, that's a pretty heavy uh, visual because yeah, yeah. I yeah. All right, let me let me get your guys' thoughts on this question here. Uh, I uh, I try to be very very careful about imposing any conditions on someone um, as a prerequisite for salvation. As a matter of fact, you know Spurgeon's sermon that we did the teaching on on the Wednesday Bible study. A warrant of faith, W-A-R-R-A-N-T, warrant of faith. In other words, what right do you have to have faith? What what gives you the warrant or the right to have faith? And whether you, you don't have to have any prerequisite is what uh, Spurgeon is saying, that you don't have to have A, B, C, D, anything. He, he's very, very thorough. He goes through every possible scenario saying, no, nope, you don't have to impose that. No, you don't have to impose that. So it would, to me, it's one of the greatest sermons uh, I've ever heard, and I, well, I should say read because I didn't hear him preach it. But uh, wow. I, I'm trying to, I, I'm trying to always keep in mind. I, I do not want to impose a prerequisite on someone before they can believe. However, I, I will say this: that it's, it's, it does seem to me that if, before people do believe, I think that they they move from pride to humility. Um, now, again, I'm not going to say this is an absolute. I have to guard against that because I, uh, I think I'd be making a serious um, error uh, to try to impose it and say that you, unless you get out of your pride and come humble, you can't believe. But uh, we, we all have this pride problem. Uh, oh, look, there's a, there's a long record of it, it, it recorded in the Bible uh, Lucifer's uh, Satan's pride and the, the pride of the angels. Uh, that's what caused the fall. The, the Bible says pride precedes the fall and, uh, and the fall of Adam and Eve. Well, uh, uh, the, the serpent appealed to their pride, saying, uh, well, you know, God does, uh, doesn't want you to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because basically he's saying, you wouldn't have the need for God. You won't have to rely on God because you can become like God yourself, understanding good and evil. And that way you'll have the wisdom to make your own decisions and won't need to rely on God. That's how I would paraphrase what was going on there. 
So because they had pride and thought, well, yeah, I can become my own God, uh, the fall of man. And now I think all of us uh, either were born with it or we develop it, this pride, this thinking, ask any person. I mean, even, almost every person I've ever asked is, uh, do you think you're a good person? Almost every person. Now, there are some I have not found that are actually really down on themselves. Like they really feel that they're horrible people. They, you know, they have a, an issue with self-esteem. You know, they, they really are the opposite of esteem of themselves. They're, they're really ashamed of themselves. That does happen sometimes. But I think for the most part, humanity has this condition of pride. And we think, I'm pretty darn good. And especially if you compare me to other people, I'm, I'm on the good side. You know, I'm not maybe the best. But I'm not one of those really bad people. I'm pretty darn good. So this pride is a default that we have. And until we get humbled, uh, we can't recognize our need for this free gift because we think, well, I can, I, I can cover myself with the, the fig leaves myself. You know, I'll just sow the fig leaves together myself. Until we realize that we cannot remedy the problem ourselves and, and we'll get humbled. Uh, how can we believe and, and the, that we have a need for this gift from Jesus? So do you, what do you think? Uh, I, I'm trying to guard against saying and making it a universal thing that you've got to be a humble person before you can get saved. What are your, thought, your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, uh, well, for starters, you mentioned something pretty interesting that's comparison, and I instantly remembered when I was at a picnic uh, in a church, and there's this brother that had a T-shirt that said "Comparison kills," and I couldn't agree more with that because uh, the standard is not Jesus. The standard is, well, I lied, but I didn't kill anyone, or things like that, or false humility, that that also translates finally into pride. And I think that we all have that little seed, and it develops. I mean, it comes with us. We are born sinners, and and we develop the, a way to get out of uh, or to or replace uh, anything or somebody else or any idol, uh, to sit any idol or, or any other thing, ourselves, I don't know, music, whatever it is, in, in the throne of God, um, until we are born again, of course, and we have this second nature, and and uh, we are restored as, as what he wanted us to be in the first place. Yeah. Um, I, I would have to say that I used to, um, when it comes to basketball and stuff like that in sports, I was very prideful. I was very prideful. I mean, I would talk so much stuff to other people and make them feel bad about themselves. And I, and I, would, get in, I would try to get in their head. And I would say I'm better than you and all this stuff. Um, I mean, I was really bad. I mean, I don't even want to mention some of the words I said back then. <laughs> um, it was really bad. I mean, really bad. Uh, but I messed up my knee a few times uh, playing football and playing basketball. Uh, I think it really brought me to uh, understanding, too, that I'm not this invincible person that I thought I was uh, growing up. I used to think I was so invincible. I can get back up. I'll be like a spring and I can do whatever. And I'll bounce, I'll bounce right back up until I messed up my knee really bad. And I was like, I can't get back up. I have to rely on crutches right now. I had to rely on crutches back then. Um, I, I, I had to, I couldn't stand for a while. It sucked. I remember going, what am I going to do? I can't, like the thing I love to play, I can't even do it. Um, that was one thing that humbled the heck out of me. And then uh, getting in trouble um, a few years back, uh, I got busted with some people. They had weed on them. They didn't tell me they had weed on them. Uh, I prayed to God and I said, if you can get me out of this, I'll do whatever you want. I was literally crying, not knowing where to go. I said, you're the only one that can get me out of this. And what happened? The, the um, persecute prosecutor, she told me, we're going to let you go. Uh, she goes, you're not going to have to pay a fine. 
uh, we're gonna wa- we're gonna wipe it clean. We're gonna buff a record in five years. I said, "Are you serious?" She goes, "I'm dead serious." I said, "Thank you, God." Yeah. <laughs> that got me on the journey of reading and searching for him because I was like, "You you just proved me wrong. I didn't believe in you." <laughs> it, it hit me. I mean, I, I would read the scriptures and say, oh, yeah, Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Jesus. You know, I used to think that when I was a teenager. It was like, it was nothing to me. I was like, oh, whatever. You know, I can do whatever I want to do in my life. And then I really, really screwed up. Um, but it, it takes, it does, I think, from what happened to me, uh, it sometimes, depending on the person, it depends on the person. Um, God does humble you in other ways. Um, and that was one example in my life that when I, when I was talking about the whole getting busted for weed, um, that, that hit me. I was like, whoa, man, I thought of, huh? Sounds familiar. No, sorry, brother. Just keep going. No, 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 you're okay. You're okay. I, I, uh, it just, it just hit me. So I was like, wow. Um, so that, that's one thing that, uh, I think that humbled me a lot. Yeah. That's amazing. That's great. Praise God. Well, uh, I'm sure that some of you are familiar with my, uh, uh, the interview that, uh, brother Mark, uh, case over did of me. And I, uh, I went through my life and told you a lot. But I only told you that much. Uh, if you knew everything that I've done in my life, the, the type of um, lying thief, criminal, horrible things I've done, that um, I don't like to go into detail because I'm, I'm still ashamed uh, of all the things I've done. But there's many times in my life where I'm thinking, there's no way I should be alive. Or... I should at least I should be in prison because and I can tell you I, I, I've got a long list of friends of mine that are dead because of the things we did um, killed in automobiles gunfights drug overdoses um, uh, crazy things and uh, and numerous friends two friends that are like they're 50 miles away from my house right now at the prison one for murder, for life, another, uh, God, this, this is Roy's, it's Roy's uh, fifth stint in prison. But actually, Dr. Peter Ruckman, I keep referring to him, he's written, he's with the Lord now, but he, he lived to be over 90-something, and he, uh, he wrote over 100 books, and I read about 40 of his books, but it turns out one of his books is, was something like Tales of a Street Preacher or something, and uh he actually uh, mentions my friend Roy, brother Roy. And uh, I first met Roy when I was in college. I was uh, teaching uh, the children's karate class at this place. And Roy was uh, like a 12-year-old kid in my class. And uh, I never saw him after that until he was grown. I bumped into him somehow and I and got to know him and found out that he'd been in prison now. And he'd say, let's say he was about uh, at that time 35. Uh, uh, let me see. Uh, let's say he was about 35 years old. He'd already been in prison for at least 15 years and several times stints. And because he's a drug addict, and then because of drugs, he'd bur- become a burglar and steal to get money for drugs. And that was routine. Then finally, he robbed a bank. Uh, and then I don't know, he did this last time, but uh, he's back in again. But Roy is mentioned in, in Dr. Ruckman's book. And, uh, but Roy, um, so I, there, I have no doubt that Roy's a believer. I mean, he knew far more than I did about the Bible, uh, let's say um, 20 years ago when, when my friendship got it, started going with him. Uh, and he's the one that, when he went to prison, that's how I inherited all of his Dr. Ruckman books. That's how I got the books to, to read. But, uh, so Roy's in prison right now, 
And uh, my other friend, Dave, um, he, he went to prison more recently and for, for murder. He taught me how to invest in real estate. He was about 20 years younger than me, but he'd already had, he was a real estate agent and he, he bought a lot of real estate and he taught me how to do it. And I ended up buying a lot of real estate and I it did I did really well. And he was also a bouncer at one of these um, Las Vegas strip clubs. And uh, I was teaching a self-defense class at Gold's Gym and he joined it. And, and then he started training. He trained with me for several years at my home. And he was a giant. He's six, six, five and 300 pounds and very powerful guy. And, and um, he owned 100 guns. And I go shooting with him, and well, it turns out that he couldn't wait to kill someone with those guns and murdered somebody. So he's out there for murder. Uh, I guess I'm just I'm, I'm telling you a lot of information, but I'm, the, the people I've known in my life, um, the things that I've been involved in, that I haven't confessed publicly. <laughs> There's a statute of limitation, I think, but I'm not about to tell you everything. But if I had gotten caught like they got caught, I'd be there now. And I, I think. Believe What's that? Are they, are they believers? Uh, is that what you're saying? Well, Roy is a believer. Uh, what about Dave, Dave is not. Dave is the one that went in for murder. Yeah, yeah. Dave's not a believer, but Roy, uh, Roy is. Uh, when I I preach to Roy to Dave, you know, uh, he says I don't want to be a, a a believer and 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 uh, get raptured. That's when I believe in the rapture and the the, the dispensational futurism viewpoint. He said, no, I don't want to get raptured. I want to be left behind because I want to be able to fight at that time. I want to be in the war. <laughs> you know, that's how that's his mindset was just kind of crazy. But uh, uh, all I'm, I'm trying to make the point that um, things that I've done in my life that I got away with, um, uh, it, it is amazing if you knew it all. And I believe that God had a hand in it all that time. That's why this is a praise song. Look, let's praise Jesus. I believe that God did have a calling for me in my life from the beginning. And, and uh, I was spared somehow getting caught or getting killed or overdosing and as all my friends were doing. And uh, uh, I was spared that. And I believe that I was spared because uh, to establish this church here online. I think that's, that's my conclusion today. I think that that's, that's what I was uh, spared to do. All right, maybe I'm making too much of it. No, praise good. I, 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 I think you're probably right, brother. Luke. Yeah, I think you're probably. Um, right. It's uh, um, it's amazing how you can look back in your life and you can see how many times God saved you from something, an event, even when we were believers. I mean, unbelievers. You know what I mean? Like for me, when uh, when I was, I was twenty years old. And I was, you know, fresh, new in my, you know, martial art training. And my, our group was, you know, always, you know, looking, not looking for trouble, but, you know, invited it, you know. And so any chance that I got, you know, if I can, if I can go in and, you know, somebody wanted to mess with me, I'd invite it. So this one guy um, um, almost hit me, ran me over. I was walking in the neighborhood uh, where I was living and, um, uh, I threw up my hands. I didn't flip him off, but I threw my hands up. He slammed on his brakes this is at night, late at night. And um, he got out of his car and he was pulling out some something. And his girlfriend was screaming at him to get back in the car. And uh, he pulled out a chain, a big, long chain in his right hand. And uh, he was he walked up to me. It was real dark, very dark street, no light or anything like that. And then he was hiding a gun in the opposite hand. So he put it right up to my head, put the gun right up to my, right up to my temple. It was a big gun. I'm, I'm not a gun, you know, I'm not a marksman or anything like that. I don't know nothing about guns, but uh, I knew this gun was, <laughs> had potential to, you know, completely uh, make a mess, put it that way. Wow. And he put it right to my head and he said, you know, do I know you and all this stuff. And it was weird. I, I, some, some people say when they, um, I'm not saying that I was saved then, but some people experience this this amazing peace when they get the gospel. This like realization, wow, I'm saved, and they they feel this big peace come come on them. At that very instant, something happened. I felt some type of inner peace come over me, or something like that. It was amazing, and 
I was so calm. I had all my adrenaline went out of me. And I looked at him straight in his eye and I said, hey, man, I'm sorry. And I said the right words and I calmed him down. And um, uh, I walked away with a pistol whip. He pistol whipped me. I pretend to go down and I, I went down and he stood above me for a second to check if I was really knocked out, which I was be- pretending. And um, and so uh, uh, he ran back his car and I and then I got up. I walked away the next day. My whole side of my face swelled up like the elephant, man. I had a giant, massive, I mean, pistol whips are not like the movies, guys, like where you get a little cut. I mean, this thing, it was like somebody hit me over the side of the head with a bat. <laughs> but I'm alive today. So, you know, I look back on things like that. I had another th- event that happened with me where I was on a job one time. I, I used to, when I was 18, I was in a hauling and demolition company. And I was, there was this, this, uh, ditch and it fell, it fell literally like 15 feet into a light little tiny river of, uh, uh, of water. And I stuck my foot up on this branch to put post my weight on it. And well, the branch looked like it was still attached to the tree and the branch had been cut off and I fell head first into this, this thing, little thing of water all the way head first and then I survived it with no brain injury or anything like that and then when the guys pulled me out I was working uh, working with all these Latino guys and these one of them looked at me and went looked down and I looked down and my hat was in between two big rocks my, meaning what he, what he's saying is that my head fell right in between the crevice of these two massive rocks and I looked at him like oh my goodness (laughs) but wow so what i'm saying is i think god saved me every time you know maybe god knows you know who's going to become a believer yeah no i don't want to say anything like that like like what brother luke was saying you know i don't want to say that you have to be humble to come before god or think but i believe that 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 god interjects you know sometimes you know and he decides when he's you know gonna save someone from dying before they go into uh, uh so they can believe on him you know so yeah well that's uh that's very very harrowing and uh i mean there's a lot of ways there's a lot of ways of reacting to that situation you were in and uh yeah. playing possum is one possible way but that doesn't guarantee that that's going to work so I yeah. mean, yeah, he stood over me for a good, you know, a few seconds to, it's almost like he was contemplating if he was just going to let, let, let loose, you know, and, and unload his, you know, his gun. So I, I, I thank God, you know, that I didn't die. I actually thought I was going to die. The words in my mind went, oh, this is it. Yeah. Wow. Oh, my life's going to be real short. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I was, I was like, whoa. It, it hit me so that I got taught a serious lesson, though, too. You know, people people are packing out there They're, they don't play fair. And, you know, they, you know, don't look at anybody in the eye. Don't get into that whole thing. That, that's the ego. See, that's the pride. <laughs> I got humbled. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I've been thinking lately that everybody's humbled. I mean, even if they don't respond to that. Uh, yeah. And there's always what I call emergency prayers. Even the unbelievers, they're going to get hit by a truck. And please, God, help me. You know, those uh, fractions of seconds, it always happens. But um, one forgets about that easily, you know, especially when one is a non-believer. Yeah, you're right. I, I, I do. I'm like... Uh... The whole thing with the being humble, uh, having to be humble before God. Uh, yeah, I do believe that's true. But in, in a way, though, also, too, because like when I was getting indoctrinated into the Calvinism, they're all about like this. I mean, they 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 use the law to smash you down. I mean, they smash you down with the law so heavy. So everyone in, in, that's a Calvinist is like, oh, they're constantly like feeling horrible about themselves like just always coming down on themselves and um so i was there and i was there for months going oh i really literally felt like this like horrible i'm a horrible 
person. I can't believe it. And, 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 and of course, and I knew that Jesus was the way, but I thought that, Hey, it's Jesus's choice, whether he wants to pick you, you know, it's up to him. I don't, you know, and that's, that's what the attitude was behind them. And finally, when I realized, wow, salvation is a choice. Like you can, you can, you can, I mean, that's what God's doing. He's commanding all mankind to believe on his son. You know, that's when, when, when you read the book of John, they're asking him, what's the works of God that we should do? He's like, these are the works of God that you should believe on his son. What's the will of God? Oh, the will of God is to believe on him. Whom he has sent. You know, and so God, you know, Jesus is trying to simple and clear, like you guys have a choice. You can believe on me and I am the way I've done all the work for you. And so finally, when I realized that's what the gospel was, and I made that decision, that's it. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I'm going to believe on you from now on, not in myself. And, and I, it was it was like I went from feeling this, uh, this you know, almost like crazy, you know, yeah. like, I, you know, I don't think I don't think God wants us to I don't think he he needs us to go into this deep state of frantic of hating yourself. But we should know that, look, we can't work for our salvation. As long as a person knows that, you know, you cannot earn your salvation. But there is one thing that you can do right in your life, and that's believe on him. Believe, believe on the Lord. Amen. Amen. I completely agree, brother. Yeah. Hmm. Very much so. Believe on that. Definitely. Um, also it says too, in John five twenty four, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Amen. Yeah, that's it. God makes it so easy for us. Like this, I, you know, I hear this complication sometimes people trying to make it so complex oh well there's this then there's that it's like no no stop complicating the gospel it's it's believe on him just trust him that's it you know and 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 don't make that a work it's not a work you know you know it's 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 something that god gives all mankind the ability to have you know faith in something put your faith in jesus you know, and he'll save you. He's, he's, he, he is faithful. I always say, believe and trust in his work. Yeah. You know, yeah. when, when I became a believer, I felt this heavy, like weight lifted off my shoulders. Like I can breathe again. I don't have to, I don't have to do nothing. He did yeah. all of it for me. Like, why does everybody want something like, I don't understand that. Like you guys, you guys are doing everything opposite of what he's saying. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's great because you're, when you, when you have, it's like a, it's like a light bulb clicks, clicks off and you're just like, wait, I don't have to act or be a certain way to get saved. Nope. Okay. It's kind of like you start having this conversation with, with Jesus. Like, okay. Uh, well, what if I sin again? You're going to sin again. Okay. All right. All right. Lord, what if I go into doubt? No, it's okay. I paid for it all. That's it. That's how you clear all that out. You, the battle is up here. Once you can get past that, the Lord is greater than your mind, is greater than all your thought processes, everything. Because I go through weird thought processes every day. Ugh, this came into my mind. Oh, crap. But but it's easy to like kind of like get fixated on self and, and your own brain, your carnal thinking. But once you have that that realization, wait a second, Jesus Christ said that he died for all sin, right? He said that sin starts in the mind, right? But that's where it's at. He washed it away, right? Unfortunately, we have to go through the carnal thinking of this life. But it's we don't have to fear it. We don't have to fear ourselves anymore. The beauty of the gospel. I think Mark, uh, I mean, uh, um, Alex was saying that uh, uh, believing in Gen- Jesus's work and, and, and rather than our, our own. I, I made a video. Actually, 
I said this early on when when we were first starting uh, that um, it, I I really turn this into a cliche. This term, I have a video about that. <laughs> I know. I no matter what we're talking about, I can I always end up saying I got a video on that or I've got a playlist on that. But I do have a video. That I think it's titled something like "Actually, Works Are Required for Salvation." Yeah, that's cool. and, and of course the title gets everybody's attention and they say, oh, no, he's a heretic. What is he doing now? He's preaching works. And uh, but I was arguing that works are required for our salvation. So Jesus did the work <laughs> yeah, for us, not our works. It's the work that he did. That's See, that's, that's, what we're required. that's how that's how some people are. are uh, um what is it called they defend the book of james like that way they say no james is talking about the works of christ i've heard it i've heard it done yeah, i've I, i've heard people say that recently i think even esteban i think you or someone recently was saying that and i really well you know how i think i i see james differently than almost everybody else but also, and we I actually at the, we've been talking quite a long time tonight but in the beginning someone was making a comment about calvinism so i went into a 20-minute tirade against calvinism <laughs> Uh, and then someone was, was somehow works and James came up and I ended up having to rehash James for everybody. So we've been through that. And I won't repeat myself again. But, uh, yeah, I do think I, I've actually heard people recently um, arguing that the uh, the work in James, James is actually talking about uh, the work that Jesus did. I think that's how, is that what you're saying, Leo? I, I'm, yeah. and, and Esteban, if yeah. I'm, if I'm misrepresenting, you could tell me, but I, I think you are, I think, are saying that now. Yeah, um, I was actually reading the book of James, and uh, when you look at verse 21 through 26, I actually compared it to Romans chapter 4. Um, so I was looking at it, and I go, yeah, that's, that's talking about Christ's finished work at the cross. Um, it's not talking about us having to work after we're saved, I believe. So, yeah. Well, um, the, um, you know, my, my position is different on that. I don't want to repeat myself all over again. But the thing about James also is that uh, uh, we don't see the deity of Christ in the book of James. Um, we don't see faith alone in Christ alone. Or we don't see the cross. The cross is not mentioned. The resurrection is not mentioned. Uh, all these things that are the most important things that we understand and uh, are uh, they're not mentioned in the book of James? That's interesting. Yeah. Actually, um, can I can I say something to that real quick? Yes. Uh, in uh, James chapter two, um, it says in the first verse, um, it says, "My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, um, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons." And right there, it's talking. I don't know where I was thinking, but it was. I thought it was saying something about his deity a little bit. Huh, maybe I, where was it at? There was something on here, somewhere near that, that I was like, wait, that sounds like his deity. Well, uh, you, you might be able to construe that there's a word here or there that might, might argue against what I said, but the teaching, I went, when I say teach something, I'm not saying finding a word. I'm talking about where you have a series of sentences uh, to make a, a, a doctrinal point. The point of the, the teaching of the deity and the cross and all that stuff is not in that book. So for people to want to use that book for salvation, uh, to me, it's, it's saying, I believe the justification he's talking about is, uh, is a justification before God for salvation uh, is uh, that uh, we're justified um, by our works and not by faith only. I think it's, he's clearly talking about salvation not being... For, and here's another thing. Again, we keep on getting back to this. So I, there's no escape for me. I have to keep on saying it. But um, the, <laughs> um, the um, people say one of the arguments that... You know, oh, by the way, the way that Renee and, and Jason Jack and, and others teach this, that's exactly how I taught it for 25 years. It's not that I'm not familiar with the position and didn't think it was a good answer to, for the for the trying to make make sense of the book, but uh, the idea that someone could be justified in God's sight by faith, but in my sight they're justified by their works—that's fallacious. 
uh, because I, I'm not. Yeah. Uh, to me, uh, no one's going to be ever be justified in my sight. In other words, I'm not going to ever justify judge someone as saved because of how they're living their life. Right. I'm I'm going to judge whether I think they're saved by their faith. What do you believe? Yeah. So uh, whether it's God or man, we should not be using works to justify them to to deem them saved or unsaved. We should we should make that judgment based upon their their profession of what do you believe. So I, I, I think the argument that, well, uh, in God's sight, yeah, it, by faith, but, but in man's sight, it's by works. No, that's... But I, I, get what, I get what you're saying, because you're saying that it doesn't prove the point for us to try to do good works in, in front of man if we're trying, to, if we're trying to show them it's not by our works. Yeah. Uh, I... I and that way, I kind of get it. There, there's a twist there that doesn't make any sense. There's kind of, I, I almost like, I don't want to say a hypocrisy, but it sounds like it, right? If we're trying to tell and explain to people, it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done. We are, we are saved solely on the finished work of Jesus Christ. And works are not required for salvation, period. And so, you know, in order to prove that, right, it's just by your confession, and it has to do with that, you know, it's, it, and so I understand that. Why would we want to try to prove ourselves in front of a man why, by our good works? Hey, look at my good works. Look how good I am. You know, if we're trying to prove to them that it's not by works. Yeah. 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 You're right. It's uh, if we argue that we're, well, James is just saying you're justified by, in man's sight because I cannot look and see what someone's heart is. Uh, because I can't do that, I can only go by their works. No, I go by their confession of faith, not by their works. Yeah, yeah. That was in the <laughs> first chapter. James uh, addresses like domestic problem, like where should the uh, people that are rich be seated, and and so on. It has like universal things too, like chapter three, but uh, it's pretty much. Uh, to like a local congregation or or addressing let's say carnal behavior yeah yeah well i mean paul addresses you know carnal behavior sometimes too and sure paul no say, corinthians paul, big paul, time yeah yeah and 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 some of i mean paul does say in some of his epistles that you know we should try to be you know upright before men and you know and do you know everything that we do in life it should be you know, to the glory of God. So that way no man could speak ill of us, you know, but, um, but Peter did say this, this in his letter. I thought this is, you know, see this, this kind of proves too that a believer can suffer in different ways. He's like, you know, I, you know, I desire that you do not suffer as a murderer, you know, you know, like he's like telling them, you know, don't, it's better that you, you suffer uh, upon trying to, do good in this life do rather good, than yeah. doing evil as a believer you're gonna yeah. you're gonna really be suffering now <laughs> all right look, um, let me let me list there's no judgment in there i mean yeah yeah, yeah no uh, let, let let me list the possible uh viewpoints on james for everybody just to consider for a second here uh the whole range of i think there's five possibilities one martin luther's position is that it shouldn't be in the Bible? Okay, I'm not. I'm <laughs> yeah. not saying. I'm saying that's Martin Luther's position. He oh, called man. it a book of straw. I think he called it, and uh, he didn't want it. A lot of people that did that era, they did not want it in the Bible because of they believe that it's teaching oh, salvation by works. So they didn't want it in the Bible. The other viewpoint uh, is that, uh, like the the hyper dispensationalist viewpoint. Uh, or even a dispensationalist viewpoint, they could say, well, obviously it's not to us. It's written to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. So we can just ignore it. Oh, but that's convenient. See, I'm going to become a hyper dispensationalist now because gosh, what an easy way of deal with James. It's not even to us. So just don't worry about it. Okay. That's another easy way. Get rid of it. Like, like Martin Luther said, or just ignore it as the hyper dispensationalists say, or what about uh, trying to 
make it make sense, try to make it, force it to make, agree with Paul. That's what we've all, we've all done. That's what all of my friends are doing. That's what I did for 25 years. And, and, and one guy, the guy that got me away from it, Mitchell Belenkoff, he's kind of like uh, shunned by all the whole community now because he finally became a Calvinist. But, but he's the one that introduced me to this new way of looking at James. And uh, um, he, he said that, uh, um, I forgot what I was saying about there. Uh, the, um, okay, the position is uh, Martin Luther, the hybrid dispensationalist, or, uh, oh yeah, he calls it, Mitch says they're trying to force a square peg into a round hole. That's how, how Mitch, <laughs> our attempts to make Paul, to make James in agreement with Paul, forcing a square peg into a round hole. That's what we, he says we're trying to do. That's my conclusion, basically. As good as Renee and, and Jason and others are at it, and I applaud them for it, because they're not using it as a lordship word to, to, to teach a damn more heresy. They're trying to make it agree with Paul, but it's like forcing a square peg in a round hole. No matter how hard we try, to, we, we, how articulate we are and how we uh, redefine things. Then there's, uh, then there's the position that, um, and that what they're basically doing is saying that uh, the way I like to express it when I believe that way was okay. Paul's teaching as an evangelist, James is teaching as a pastor. An evangelist is just teaching how to get saved. The the pastor's responsibility is trying to get people to live up to it now and 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 do good works. So that's that that's that's how to uh, another way of understanding it. Then there's the way I believe. James means exactly what it says. That the very first time you read it, you understand it correctly, and it's shocking because this is, doesn't agree with what I just read in the Gospel of John. This is scary. In fact, I remember when I first was reading the Bible, I got saved, and then I get to James. I was so horrified by James at that time. I avoided it for at least 10 years. I wouldn't even read it. I never wanted to read it again because it was so opposite. It was clear to me he's saying the opposite of Paul. So I avoided it. Now, wow. <laughs> I, 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 my conclusion still is he and Paul are disagreeing. I believe that, that James is articulate, and, and you can believe exactly what he said is exactly what he meant. We don't have to redefine his words and try to, try to force his words to agree with Paul. And so those are the, the possibilities. It shouldn't wow. be in the Bible like, like uh, Martin Luther says, or we should just ignore it like the hyper D say. It's not. It's only to the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, or, or we can make it agree with Paul, uh, or, or, or we can say that uh, he's teaching a different message than Paul, and, it, and the church hadn't worked out the whole thing at that time when it was written. It hadn't been worked out. The church had to go a transition to finally realize what Paul was emphasizing. You can't hold on to Judaism. If you're going to believe in Jesus, you've got to leave Judaism behind. You can't add them together. Yeah. yeah, true. yeah. For me, it was like that, but like two years later that I came to the Lord, but it first uh, caught my attention like the the social thing, like addressing all the churches uh, about the rich people, and chapter three above everything, like the the tongue and the, the, from the same fountain, uh, can it, they can flow uh, bitter water or and and, uh, and sweet water and all that. Uh, and later I started looking into it, uh, but it was no conflict for me at first, and uh, that made me think throughout the years. Sometimes we even call some lord shippers by name but i used to listen to a lot of them and i think that uh, god uh, not only in me but in many other people uh, like your friends brother luke that they took you when you were not a believer um, and they were expecting you to come to christ and they and you heard preachings that now you disagree with i think that in a way the lord uh, filters all that because he knows like Leo was saying before, up front, what's going to happen to us. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Now, the thing about the hyper D and the Paul only is that I, I think is um, actually, uh, in, a, in a way, I like what they're doing because I would, I would advise people, okay, you want to read the Bible, 
Let's just read the Gospel of John 10 times or 20 times and stick with that for a while. Then after you've got John so much in your DNA that everything is tested against the Gospel of John, now you're ready for the Pauline epistles. Read all of Paul's epistles and then, and then. Now, everything else can, can probably going to confuse you unless you get that is so ensconced in John and, and Paul, then then if you get really good at understanding that, then you'll be able to sort out the rest. But if you don't have that as a foundation, then you re and you start reading, uh, you know, uh, the the other gospel accounts and the other epistles and, and the Old Testament, you could very easily get very confused about what the role of works uh, in salvation. So, uh, uh, I'm kind of like the hyper D saying, let's stick to, to Paul. But they say, hey, John, you can't get saved by reading the gospel of John. That is such an insult <laughs> to Jesus and John. You know what? Yes. You, you know, there is, a, there is a, a, a brother that I actually support his ministry. I, I follow his channel, and he's, he's a dispensationalist, but he, he even says, I am not. A hyper dispensationalist he said you know some people believe that you you know they say that you you uh, can uh you're only supposed to be following you know paul's letters or 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 what do you say say by paul's letters and all that stuff but it's robert breaker i know you probably heard of him before and he explains it like that too that you know it's written to the 12 tribes of of of, of uh, israel scattered abroad and and um He's got an interesting, you know, way of breaking down the Bible. You know, he's a good teacher, but um, he's a sensationalist. He's a brother in Christ. I know he is. His, he, he understands the gospel clearly, but he doesn't go so far as like what you're saying, Brother Luke, uh, where some people are saying, oh, you can only you can only uh, you can't get saved by any of the, the four gospels, you know, or anything like that. Um, so, yeah. I, I've watched some of his videos. Uh, Robert Breakers. Yeah. Uh, the thing that I don't agree with him, though, uh, is that he says it, it was by works in the Old Testament. Yeah, he, he uh, uh, so basically what they what he believes and a lot that a lot of brothers and sisters, too, that I've talked to believe is that in the Old Testament that they had to do the blood sacrifice to keep the sin off of them for, for a year. And that was a requirement. And it was basically, that was the covenant that they were under. And, and there was, they were not, they didn't, they were not under our covenant that we are under today, today. So therefore that was the way of their salvation was through animal sacrifice. Well, you if know? you, if you look at it like this too, though, um, okay, so when you read the book of James and then you look at what they did in the Old Testament, you can yeah. use it like you can also look at it like this it was to show their faith of, of there was yeah. a savior to come. So when you look at it from the book of James and then you compare it to the Old Testament, when they were doing all that, the blood sacrifices and everything, it's to show their faith to others so that way when others say, Hey, why are they doing all this stuff? and then the person go, Well, there's a savior to come. Well, the, so, the, what they would argue against that, though, is they would say, if you were not following the law that, that way, you were to be stoned and put to death, and it was by God's orders. So that's that's why Robert but Breaker... The reason, you know, the reason uh, why they were put to death, the reason why they were yeah. put to death, though, is because they weren't doing it by faith. They were doing it just to do it. So if they didn't have faith in doing those things showing their faith of there's a savior to come god's like all right just like how if we keep on continuing to do something bad 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 con continually in this life we reap those consequences so right when you look at it from that perspective it's like that that's just how i see it i mean that's just what i think when i read the old testament uh, what think brother luke what do you think about the the people that were under under the law the 10 commandments that three was it 313 or 613 laws under is it 613? Well, um I, I challenge anybody to give me anything in the old testament that ever says that a person gets eternal life by following the laws 
Um, what you find out uh, in right. the Old Testament is that uh, God even says, there are several verses I can't give you off the top of my head, but I'll get them for you if you need them. And that is, it says that if you follow these laws, I will bless you and and uh, get you to the promised land. That's all. And, you know, the land that he's promised them to get to. Uh but they'll get blessings by following the law, the laws. Uh, but ne- the laws were never intended for Israel to earn uh, eternal life. Uh, that's one thing. Um, the other thing about, uh, uh, you know, I don't know. I keep hearing his name, Robert Breaker, and I understand, I guess, he's a, he's not hyper dispensational, but regular dispensational is kind of like, probably like Dr. Ruckman and uh yeah. And in that, that viewpoint, he has all the charts and the timelines. And of, yeah, uh, yeah. And he's definitely that, a Ruckmanite. That's that's the viewpoint that I uh, I held for for 25 years. I trusted Larkin and Ruckman, and I think that he he might even be a Ruckmanite, someone who's learned through Ruckman and and teaches the same things that he did. But the problem is that if someone thinks that before uh, the cross that people did get salvation by uh, faith plus works, then you still have the, the, the dilemma of, okay, exactly what are the works and to what extent did they have to be followed? And, and uh, the, uh, I have a saying of all these sayings, I, a matter of fact, the new, new term I've come up with is, I'm gonna call them truisms. We have about 20 of them we've collected. Brother Jason Jack just sent me four more today I added to the list. We're going to go over all these, and I want to promote these so that everybody starts repeating them because in a few words, we have a profound truth expressed. So uh, that's what I want to try to accomplish. But um, one of these, I, I coined the term, works never work. In the past, in the Old Testament, works couldn't work because the, love, the, the amount of works and the degree of works has to be 100% perfect. No one ever was able to get, do perfect works from the first breath to the last breath. And that's what would be required if, uh, if works were needed for your salvation. And so we know that. We recognize that today. Why would anybody think that before the cross that people could successfully get saved by their works? And they also say that in the future there will be a dispensation in the, in the uh, tribulation or the millennial period and 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 work it'll be faith plus works then well works never work because perfect works are needed so that it, to me it just it all falls apart if we understand that the the the, the uh, works are not come on you you think that you can give offer your works to god no matter how good you think they are god says it's filthy rags god god says paul says that you uh if you want to be under the law, that you're putting yourself under a curse. Why? Because it's impossible to follow the law perfectly, and that's what would be needed. Perfect. Um, Jesus said it's impossible. With man, it's impossible. Only with God is it possible. And and and, and Paul says, uh, uh, I mean, James says, here we go. I'll, I'll use James in a positive way. James says, if you offend in one point, if you if you if you follow all the law but offend in one point, you're guilty of all. So uh, we should understand that if that's what's required, then they weren't didn't do it in the Old Testament, and they're not going to do it in some future dispensation. No one is able to do it. Anyway, okay, let me ask. Let me ask you this, brother Luke. Okay, speaking about the old the 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 the, the people in the old covenant now. Did God give the Israelites the law to enforce people? And and did so when you're about to have stoning, let's say uh, somebody committed fornication, right? The law said to to stone, right? They were mm-hmm. to be stoned. So do you think that God what he wanted to see was the person, the people doing the stoning to go, wait a second. I still, even though though I haven't committed fornication in my mind, I want it to, you know, I was lusting after brother so-and-so's wife or something. Right. And, but, okay, well, but the law says to stone. So they went and did it. Now I wonder 
if God wanted to see them say, we can't do this. We can't, we can't condemn these people that we're about to kill right now because we're just as guilty up here. So I, I wonder, I, I, I always wonder that part in it. Did God give the law of Moses to really physically enforce it? Or did he give it to them to just show them that they, they you know, their hypocrisy? Interesting. Okay. Um, all right. Go ahead. Someone respond. I want to answer it, but I, want, I don't want to talk all the time. So go ahead and someone else respond first. I, I agree with that. Like, I think it was to show them how much of a sinner they were to get them to come to their knees and say, we need you to save us. I can't do this on my own. I don't know how to do this. Please show me. Like, I don't know what I'm doing right. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I feel like I'm just, I'm no good. I'm no good. I can't, like, my thoughts are even wicked. You know, when you think about it, it's true. I mean, I mean, we're all men here, right? So, I mean, we all thought, hey, man, that woman over there, whew, man, <laughs> like, come on, you know, you can't tell me that you didn't think that, <laughs> come on. Well that's, the, well, that's what I'm saying, like, can you imagine, you're, you're, you're with Moses, you're trying your best, but then all of a sudden, somebody in the camp, you know, they go out and do something, you know, where the law says, you know, you need to stone that person, that person to be stoned, so... What do you do? Are you going to be the one picking up the rocks? I I couldn't. I couldn't be a part of that, you know? And then there was in one scripture where it's there was a couple people that didn't want to follow the law, and I think they were I think they were stoned. So I just want to get more, more perspective on that. Yeah, I, like I said, I, I think I think you're right on that. I mean, like I couldn't do that. <laughs> I mean, we like I said we all at one point we even you know now i mean sometimes i even think that way i go whoa dude she's hot <laughs> like i'm not gonna sit here and tell you i don't think that way because sometimes i do i'm a young i'm 20 i'm gonna be 27 i mean come on <laughs> excuses 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 bro <laughs> <laughs> just kidding you got you got two youngins here uh brother luke sorry <laughs> yeah but i think uh, the the thing is that my best or to keep the low the best i can became self-righteousness then you see yeah. we don't even mention the name you know we spell it uh, this way or we say hashem we say the name so we make fences around the commandment we're even better than anybody else and that spirit actually became so evil, and uh, it's still going on today. It's a strong religious spirit of pride. Yeah. Well, um, okay, I want to respond, but um, we, we got some interesting comments in the chat room too. Here, let me read a few of these here. Uh, the I, would, I wish I could read it. Sorry, guys, I can't. I'm using my phone, so if anybody's saying anything to to me, I. I can't read any of the comments. Well, I could just jump the, in. My phone pretty much the, the consensus. The consensus in the chat room is, Brother Leo is just such a blessing to all of us. Brother Leo is a wonderful voice. What a great t uh, songs he's making. Brother Leo is. Thank you for being here. Oh no, it doesn't really say that, but <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure that's what they're thinking, though, brother. Yeah. No. <laughs> okay. I just thought I'd have fun with the fact you can't read it, but uh, okay. Here's what there are I saying. Amen to that anyway. Yeah, we say amen. That's how I feel. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Rich Bus is. Uh, um, good one. Uh, okay. Um, Rich Bob says, uh, I have the understanding that they went, hey, God. Give us rules, and we won't fail. And God said, "Challenge accepted." Well, I, I, I've heard it that I've heard that too, explained by uh, Brother Michael Array. He's explained it that way too. Uh, well, I did talk about the, the the what happened in the garden earlier tonight, and uh, uh, I, again, it's it, it's it, the the fall of the angels. 
the fall of man and the dilemma of all the descendants of Adam and Eve is this pride that we have. And the pride makes us want to think that I, can, I don't need God. I'll solve the problems on my own. And that's what Adam and Eve basically decided that hey, uh, rather than uh, just a tree of life and just depending on God for everything, I want to be independent from God. If I, if I have the knowledge of good and evil, I'll be able to be independent and make my own decisions. And I'm sure I all make the right decisions. And um, I have a video on that <laughs> called De Declaration of Dependence. And uh, I think what happened is Adam and Eve declared independence from God. And what we need to do to fix that is understand dependence on God for our salvation. Uh, but talking more about this, this uh, place of, of the law uh, in the Bible, um, there's, there's three possibilities, two that I'm sure of, and one that is I'm sure is wrong. One is that the law is used for earning salvation. The Bible doesn't say that anywhere. The Old Testament, as I said, it doesn't say that's how you get eternal life in the Old Testament. It doesn't say that in the New Testament. It actually uh, contradicts it. But, uh, but uh, then the other thing is, uh, well, what is the law for? Two things. The Old Testament says that if you follow my commandments, I'll bless you as a nation. So it's to get blessed, to, take, to have good things in life. And then also the other reason, as Paul points out, is it's a schoolmaster to teach us our need for Jesus, our, the impossibility of following laws and, 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 and presenting our, our own righteousness to God. And uh, so um, those are the reasons. The real reason is for Israel to get blessed as a nation and, and for the, as Christians, to be uh, humble us and realize our need for salvation through Jesus. But here's another thing. Do you think that when God says, don't fornicate, actually, let's say, don't commit adultery. Let's use that one. Is he saying don't commit adultery because, you know, uh, uh, there, there are times in my life when uh, I thought, you know, I'm not really happy with my wife, and uh, uh, I'll just uh, go out and get a girlfriend. And, uh, in fact, I did. I've confessed that before. And uh, so I'll just commit adultery. I don't have any problem with it, you know. And uh, I didn't have any issues against it, even though I knew, even though I hadn't read the Bible, I knew the Bible said don't commit adultery. <laughs> but I did it anyway. Now, I'm thinking now, does God say don't commit adultery because he wants to spoil my fun? He say, look, I don't want you to party. You're having too much fun with your adultery. I don't want you to have that much fun. He's not a party pooper. He's not, he's not telling us don't do this and don't do that because he's trying to prevent us from having a good time. We have a sex drive. Sex, sex is um, very uh, pleasing. Most people like it and, and they want to do it. And, but he, why would he want to make us enjoy it and then say you don't do it? Because he's trying to frustrate us? No, he's saying don't do it for your own good. You don't know what's best for you. I do. If you commit adultery, you're going to have unplanned pregnancies. You're going to have venereal diseases. You're going to have divorce. You're going to have all these complications that come from it. That's why I'm telling you not to do it. Don't steal because... Uh, Look what the result is. Someone else is going to go without. And, and there's all kinds of it. And, and, and if you get caught, someone's going to get their sword and want to kill you for it. And so look at all the possible uh, ramifications that come from these sins. So God is saying, don't do the things, not because he doesn't want us to enjoy ourselves, but because he wants to protect us from the consequences that come from these bad actions. Exactly. And he knows that we're not going to enjoy ourselves in the end. Yeah. Basically, what I tell people, especially non-believers, is uh, when God says no, it's not just a list uh, of of no's. You know, it's basically don't hurt yourself. Yeah. yeah. But brother, Luke, what do, what do you think about the implementation of the of the of 
of the stoning. Okay, yeah, uh, that's something I wanted to talk about. I'm glad that my comment stimulated your thought about that question there, because it's logical to follow up with that. Uh, I've said oftentimes to support my position on, on no eternal torment, um, I don't even think there's going to be a, a, a momentary torment, much less eternal torment. I don't think it's it's God's character to, to uh, torment people at all, especially like the idea of burning them with fire. Could you imagine, would you burn anybody with a blowtorch for one minute? I mean, how, how many humans, unless they're a psychopath, how many humans would get pleasure or desire to burn people like that? Uh, and so it's not really the, the doesn't describe the nature and character of God, the God of the Bible. Even when God does the things, he destroys them quickly. He doesn't prolong it and, and, and torture them. And capital punishment is the choice God makes. That's the default for punishments. It seems if, if, if anything, he's quite liberal with capital punishment. You even, uh, you know, you're, you're rude to your parents. Stone them, kill them. Well, that's, I think that's because we don't understand, as God does, that uh, this thing about this. Look, everybody is going to die. We know that. And whether you live one year or 10 years or 50 years or 100 years, you're going to die. So does it really matter to, to, to God how long you live? You're going to die anyway. So if, if, if he says, the punishment I choose is capital punishment. And, and he seems to be maybe a little too liberal with it according to our human perspective, why is he so quick to want to just kill people, punish him with capital punishment? And I, I think that just make, makes the case that, uh, well, he think he, in God's mind, it's better just to end your life. It's kind of a merciful thing to do to end someone's life rather than to imprison or torture. The Bible, there's no case of God declaring that someone's going to be imprisoned for any period of time, and there's no case of people being tortured. So why would we think that they're going to be imprisoned forever in a torture chamber? Hell, no, they're going to just be, they're, they're going to, life's terminated, capital punishment, is got, got God's choice uh, for punishment. And whether it's it's just, if, God, if, if we're going to live only a temporary period of time compared to eternity, even a hundred years is a grain of sand on the beaches of the earth in terms of uh, eternity, right? And that can't even compare to eternity. So, uh, the idea that someone would God would end someone's life early uh, is not uh, is not a shocking thing to me. If we're all going to die anyway, whether he's going to take us earlier because uh, because he believes in capital punishment, that makes sense to me. But it do doesn't make sense that this God that I, I understand in the Bible has the character of imprisoning or torturing. It's not it's not what, what I find his prescription is for punishment. What do you? Okay, what do you think about this? Here's here's a thought. These are thoughts that come up in my brain. <laughs> um, okay, so the the Israelites, uh, from my what I understand, basic basic knowledge is that they were not vessels of the Holy Spirit. They did not possess the Holy Spirit. Was not uh, living inside of them, right? Like us today, we can say that we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, right? That's that's what we have today. So back then, they didn't have that. So they didn't even have the Spirit of God living inside of them. And God gave them the law, right? So they couldn't even see things or, or, or feel things uh, by having the Spirit of God inside of them. How could they? How could they even uh, have the right? you know, the right way of thinking, right? How, how could, how did the people back then get saved? And I was wondering, like, wouldn't it even be fair to say that they were under a curse, you know, since they were under the law and they didn't even have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them, in them, that they were under a curse, the Israelites. That's very interesting because in the Old Testament, like the prophets and everything and all that's written, is the spirit of the Lord, but it came and went. It's, they, you're right. They, they didn't have a right. access at it because Jesus hadn't even died or resurrected. Yeah, yeah. that's a good so they, point. But, yeah, they can't have the spirit telling them nothing good dwells in this body, but the sure. spirit of the Lord. You know what I mean? And they can't have the the, the spirit, get, you know, basically 
you know, interceding with their thoughts and, and giving them real truth, you know, exactly. and, and knowing and perceiving the law the right way. Yeah. The, the thing is, too, though, you got to remember, they also had seers. They had they had the um, like Jeremiah. They had they had Daniel. They had um, all these different prophets that were coming to them and telling them, thus saith the Lord. So you got to remember that, too. You know, yeah, what God did always the people had do? somebody. What did, what did the people do with those prophets, though? They, they killed them. They killed them. They killed them. Because they didn't want to hear. They wanted to. They had itching ears. A lot of them had itching ears like we do nowadays, too. They just want to hear what they want to hear. And I don't want to the... hear what God has to say. I want to hear what I want to hear. Mm-hmm. How did that all, how did the Old Testament uh, 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 people that were under the law even get saved if they were not basically they did not like once they believed they didn't get the Holy Spirit living inside them? I always pondered that. Think think about it like this though. Remember uh, David? He kept saying, uh, "Don't take away the, the the Holy Spirit. Don't take him away from me." Um, it's always God. God's the one that you know. Even it tells you in. Uh, what was it? What was Jesus? Th- Jesus said that he had to, like, as Jonas went into the uh, the belly of the well for three days and three nights, so uh, so is the son of a man going to go in there. He was talking about hell. He was talking about going in there, and he was telling them, this is what happened. This is what you guys were trusting in, in the Old Testament, for a Savior to come. I'm that Savior. Here you go. We're going up. Heaven is open. David was in his presence all the time, even when he didn't understand him or he complained to him or when he praised him. So that's pretty interesting, the struggle that he had there. Yeah, that is. And uh, remember the the, uh, Old Testament saints were in Abraham's bosom. Talks about that, doesn't it? In the scriptures as well. When we see Lazarus, yeah, sure. Well, uh, yes. The uh, I think you asked the question: How did they get saved in the Old Testament? And and then you expounded on it. But the the question uh, that that's the uh, that's the difference of opinion between a dispensationalist and a non-dispensationalist. Right. I, I'm non-dispensational in, in in terms of dispensational being a different set of rules for a period of time of history. That uh, no, I think that uh, throughout from Adam and Eve. To, to the end of time, it's always been exactly the same thing. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. I agree. Okay? Uh, that, now, I have a playlist um, titled um, The Bloody Trail. And, 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 and it's, it's called The Bloody Trail, Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' Blood Atonement. is the full title. And, and we can see that from... Um, from the first prophecy in the Bible about uh, stepping on the head of Satan, and and then and then uh, Adam and Eve not solving the problem through their sowing of leaves, but God providing the blood sacrifice and the animal skin to Cain and Abel, and the, the works of uh, Cain uh, Abel being uh, I mean, um, the works of Cain being rejected, and the blood of uh, Abel being accepted. Over and over and over again, uh, probably 20 examples in the, on that playlist. Uh, I don't think we covered everyone in the Bible, but over and over again in the Old Testament, you have these pictures and shadows of this gospel message that man needed to rely on God providing salvation. Grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, we needed to rely on God to remedy the problem instead of trying to remedy it ourselves through our own efforts. And, uh, and then the other... Uh, uh, what was the other playlist uh, uh, that I was going to say? Um, Can you repeat the name of that playlist again, Brother Luke? Uh, the Bloody Trail, Pictures and Shadows of Jesus' and Blood Atonement. Oh, um, and then, uh, God, there was another playlist I was going to also uh, elaborate on to, to make this point. But, uh, okay, the difference is, in, in what they believed before Jesus appeared and what we believe now is now we understand it, the uh, this Christ is Jesus Christ the name Jesus didn't was not associated with Christ 
the only name it says his name will be Emmanuel, or he no he will be called Emmanuel. Uh, and but that's not because that's going to be his name. Jesus is not was not called Emmanuel, in, except in the sense that the interpretation means this is God with us. Uh, so uh, the name Jesus is not identified with the Christ until he appeared as Jesus Christ. So if before they were looking forward to the same, I'm saved because God's going to be gracious. I'm relying on God to, uh, to pro provide uh, this salvation for me through a promised Savior, the Christ. They looked forward to that, they had faith in God providing this provision for their salvation. That's how they were saved. Yes, now, we look back say, now we look back and say, we're saved by the grace of God because he, uh, uh, he did provide this Christ, and it's Jesus Christ who died on the cross for our sins. So, uh, so the, 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 the faith is the same, except now we know his name and know exactly how he accomplished it. Back then it was blurry. That's why they say the Old Testament is the old is the New Testament concealed. All of everything in the New Testament is concealed. Little bits here and there, pictures, and some of it, like Isaiah 53 and Psalm 22. These are things that are uh, you know uh, tell us about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Oh, I was going to say about Job. Yeah, watch my playlist on Job. You know, Job was the oldest book in the Bible, right? Uh, watch my playlist on Job. You'll see Job believed just as we do that God, he needed God to be a savior instead of relying on his works. That's why Job is such a beautiful book, but I didn't realize until I studied and taught the book how the gospel was so clearly understood by Job. So that's to answer your question. How were they saved in the Old Testament compared to now? Uh, I think that's what you asked, Leo. Yeah, uh, that's pretty cool. Um, I was thinking, it, so I, I have like a pretty, you know, wild way of thinking. Maybe it's just my imagination. <laughs> um, you know, when when you read things in the Bible that say that Jesus was slain, he was the lamb slain uh, from the foundation of the world, or he was, you know, the works were already done before the foundation of the world. I always ponder this foundation, the phrase foundation of the world well the foundation is christ right and i i wonder if when it's you know so it's the foundation of the world we always think okay before the world was formed like and everything but i wonder if when it's saying the foundation of the world the foundation being the cross and see the the cross is beneficial whether it goes back in time or, or forward in time right so when jesus died on the cross the works were completed. The work was completed right then and there. And so those who were believing before the cross were still sealed with the, the promise of the Holy Spirit. And they didn't even know it. They became vessels of the Holy Spirit because the works were finished there. And God lives out time, outside of time space that when you believe, boom, you still get the yeah. Holy Spirit living inside of you. Now, this what I know people would say would would talk about the Abraham bosom thing. You know the the you know Abraham's bosom and, I, but what if that was just a parable, right? Abraham's bosom was just a parable. Jesus was using it during that time and, and, and for you know a purpose. And basically, what I'm trying to say is, is that. You know how, how it's kind of like when, when uh, Paul says, we're already seated in the heavenlies. We're already there. We're just experiencing time and space in this world, this fallen world. But we're already with Christ in the heavens as though we were always there. I love you know? that. You know, so it's just interesting when you think about it and God, through God's perspective, living outside of time and space, he completed the works and we're experiencing it in time and space. It's almost like that movie Back to the Future. Like he went, he goes to the future, he does some things, bam, he goes back, and things are changed. Like what the heck, you know? Thoughts, yeah, you know. Yeah, definitely. Um, I wanted to also point out too in Leviticus uh, chapter one verse three, uh, it says, "For his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd. Let him offer male without blemish. He shall offer it 
of his own voluntary uh, will, will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. But when you look at that, that's talking about Christ, because he's the one that offered himself without spot or blemish to God. It, it was it was he, he never broke one law. He was perfect in all ways. And he was the perfect sa sacrifice. He um, he's the Lamb of God, uh, like it says in John chapter one, verse twenty nine, who taketh away all the sins of the world. Yeah. So, so I'm showing you right there. That's Christ. Amen. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. I, what I was thinking, though, like basically how I try to kind of reason with all this stuff, because, you know, when you read some of the stuff from the Old Testament, it, 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 it is, you know, it sounds crazy. It sounds like, wow, I can't believe people were under the law and then they had to go through those things. But, but the way I kind of reconcile that is that even if the person had committed this act and they were stoned if they were a believer they were saved you know what i mean even if even if judgment was put on them on this earth it's kind of like how we have laws in the land well that was just that law that was being implemented to the uh to israel uh, during that time you know yeah. and now thank god by by his grace we are not under that type of you know that type of rule you know what I mean? Because I mean, it would life would be hard for us guys if we were under the rule of the Old Testament. That's why Paul's saying, "Man, it's done, guys. It's, guys, it's over. You know, it's mm -hmm. don't got to do the law." Yeah. Plus, plus we don't have that uh, in our carnal mind. We we can't grasp eternity, and now we can yeah. do better. Like we have, there's the fullness of the Spirit. It's poured out in all flesh. I mean, poured out. Uh, as long as uh, believers are here on earth. And the yeah. interesting thing about it is that sometimes we can't even grasp with the verse that you, Leo, just quoted, that we are seated in heavenly places. Yeah. Now, some days or some moments, we, we don't even believe that. Yeah. But it's like time to, to grasp that moment that we, we are born again. We have that new eternal dimension that people yeah. in the Old Testament were not aware of even. Yeah, it, it's it, that's all. Another, another thing I was thinking about with all this stuff, too, is is if what I'm saying, if it could be true for, or if it is true, you know, because, you know, Christ's finished work basically can do the same thing, you know, that it does to the people before the cross. If Christ did tell Nicodemus, the, the spirit moves and it goes and, and the person doesn't know whether it came or whether it went, you know what I mean? So I, I almost take that as, you know, you know, maybe somebody back in that in, in the Old Testament, they they're trusting in God and his finished work. They're trusting they're trusting in the gospel. Right. And boom, when they did that, they, I mean, they didn't know if they had this Holy Spirit living inside them. Now, somebody might say, no, the Holy Spirit was able to go and doing this. Well, it sounds like the Holy Spirit can do anything it wants and at all times, you know, so. In that aspect, you know, we you can't limit the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit can do everything at once, you know. Mm -hmm. huh. Well, um, you know, I, I, my programs I usually like to keep right about two hours, and uh, we've been we've gone over three hours now, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, I, I'm I've been hesitant to try to cut it off because of uh, uh, how much fun I'm having, and and uh, I think. The Holy Spirit's uh, leading us to talk about a lot of things that are, people need to understand. So I think it's all good. But there does come a time where I think uh, we need to start um, summing things up and, and uh, saying good night. It's, it's, it's late back east, at least. At least, Leo, you and I here in the West, it's only 9.42. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let's, let's now, um, uh, I want to ask... Uh, Alex, Leo, and Esteban to take a, a minute and kind of summarize your thoughts uh, on, on on the discussion tonight. You know, we're supposed to be basically using this as a praise-a-thon, uh, and we did some of that, but we got into a lot of theology, and it wasn't really my intention for Friday before that, but it was good. I, I enjoyed every bit of it, and I'm sure that a lot of people liked it, so... Um, 
okay, um, I don't know what it's going to be every Friday night, but I know I had some great fellowship tonight. How about Brother Alex? Why don't you go first and give us a little summary on, on the time tonight? Well, it was a great time. I enjoyed it a lot. I didn't know if I could jump in, so I appreciate you for having me, Brother Luke. And yes, it's always time to, to praise God and to reflect on, on things and, and to edify ourselves. Like sometimes you don't really want to share the good things that are going on, but that's uh, pretty much encouraging to other people that maybe are having a bad day or a bad time. And above all, agreeing in the essentials, unity and non-essentials, liberty and in all things, charity. So God bless you all. And God bless the panel too. I couldn't get in the chat very much um, because I'm in my phone. But love you all and thanks for having me, brother. Yes. All right, thank you. Okay, brother, brother Leo, what do you think? It was it was really fun. Yeah, thank you, thank you for uh, getting me on here and and um, uh, loved discussing things about the Bible and and also too just being having being able to have like a, a casual conversation about all this stuff and and you know being able to freely speak your mind and your ideas without you know people you know, freaking out. Oh, no, you know, this brother believes that, you know, as long as we're all agreeing and contending on, on the faith, you know, on the finished work of, of Christ, you know, like what brother Luke says, we have liberty, you know, it's like we have liberty to, to expand our mind and to, and to go into different, you know, you know, uh, different ways of thinking about things. It's okay. You know, and, and uh, charity, like you said, you know, the, I, that's what I love about this group is the, the group has charity and this is something that we can all practice every day. I know I don't have charity every single day. <laughs> I wish I did, but uh, it's a good reminder too. And it's, it's awesome when believers come together, there's this beautiful bond and it's amazing. I discovered recently that there was a believer at my job and I'm blown away by it because it was, it was actually you know, a person that, you know, I just wasn't maybe too fond of. And, but, you know, it's like the Lord hit me with that, you know, and it was, it, it blew my, blew me away. And he, and I, I talked to him, he says, I know it's not by works. And I'm like, oh my goodness. <laughs> so now, so now this person, you know, that I once felt weird with, you know, there, there is this instant, there's a peace there. There's a peace. And when we see each other, there's a bond and there's now we're hugging each other and it's, it's all good, you know? And that's how God is, you know, Jesus, I'm not saying he was my enemy, but you know, Christ, Christ said, you know, the people that, that you once, you know, once were your enemy and you know, they'll, you'll be, be over at your house, you know, that, and it blows my mind of how, when you enter in Christ, when you when you when you go and and you become part of the body, there's that unity and that bond. I'm not saying that we're always nice to each other, and I know there's there's other believers that you know fall into you know you know debates and stuff like that, and that's what causes a lot of you know strife. But there should be this bond between us, and it's so much thicker than blood. You know, it's it means so much more because we, we are, we know spending eternity with each other in paradise guys. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Awesome. I, uh, yeah, that last point there, the idea of spending eternity with you guys, uh, I'm excited about that. Uh, I, I, I enjoy your company and, uh, yeah, I, don't think, I, easy, so. I don't think I'm ever going to get tired of it, but, uh, uh, um, Esteban, uh, you were the first to, to to join me. Saw me on my own here, uh, basically uh, doing a uh, a sermon instead of a conversation. So you joined me. So thank you. And uh, what do you think of the time tonight? It was amazing. Thank you for having me on, uh, Leo, uh, Alex. Uh, Brother Luke, thank you guys. It was awesome getting to hang out with you guys. It's always a pleasure. Uh, I love hearing the conversation. 
I love that we can talk about non-essentials and that we can come together on the essentials. Um, it's, it's awesome. Praise God for that. Praise Jesus, our, our Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Uh, all glory goes to him. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Amen. All right. Uh, well, I, I don't know how everybody thinks about my, uh, my remark here. I put in the beginning of the chat room, kind of an announcement. I wrote this, I said, fellowship Friday, panel is only for those who believe our core doctrines as expressed in the following statement of faith. If you completely agree with our statement of faith, then you are invited to join the live panel by using the following link. Um, I, I, I just want to take a minute to explain that why I am, I see that as a, um, a method of operation here for this program is that uh, uh, fellowship means that you are, uh, it, it's something, uh, a relationship time spent with other believers. You cannot have a fellowship if you have a mixed congregation of wheat and tares, you know? Um, so I, that's why I insist that on the panel that everybody agree on these, uh, the statement of faith, the core doctrines. Um, and uh, again, the, the other thing that's different is that uh, on Sundays and Wednesdays, I, I send that link to a, 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 just a, a few people that are selected for a purpose. And this time on Fridays, I post the link publicly. Anybody in the chat room can join as long as you agree with our core doctrines. So uh, I expect to have um, sometimes more people and a different variety of people than Sunday and Wednesday. Uh, now, participating in the chat room, you don't have to agree with our core doctrines to be in the chat room if you're just there to observe and learn and, and, and consider what we're, we're saying you're welcome however you're not welcome to go into the chat room and start arguing against our core doctrines that's like walking to, to a church one night and start telling the, the pastor in the congregation that they're all their, their their core doctrines are wrong who would tolerate that so, uh, but but uh, even non-believers are welcome to be in the chat room and listen and ask questions. That'd be, I, I hope you will do that. So that's how I see this Friday night program, the construct of it. And uh, hopefully, I'm going to try to do it each Friday, um, but there will be times probably where I'm either not able or I have an alternate program for the night. I'm, I have on the agenda some programs with uh, Dr. Brother Jason Jack that we're, we're, we're going to do and a few other things in mind. So sometimes it might not happen where I have this kind of a program, but probably more times than not, uh, I'm gonna attempt to, to have this offered on Friday as a, a fellowship Friday. Okay, uh, any final thoughts from anybody before I say good night? Praise okay. Jesus. Yeah, praise Jesus. Thank you, praise Jesus. You. And we, we did uh, uh, tell everybody of, about some of the great blessings that uh, we want to we want to we want to boast in our great Savior God Jesus. Okay, thank you everybody for participating, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God Jesus. Good night.